my intuition is that a recession is inevitable, but the market can remain crazy longer than you can remain solvent, whatever the quote is. Um, why hasn't it happened yet? And how do you think about, because obviously you have the, you have similar concerns that I have, only the paranoid survive, but how do we turn paranoia into an action plan? Yeah, so everything is right now about mapping out different possibilities. So for example, if we're right now in a conference room and we got bored to write on, we would write on, you and I would write down and we would say, okay, uh, World War III takes place. What do you think are the chances of this taking place? Ray Dalio says 50%. Yes, he okay? does. A, um, Jamie Dimon says this is the most dangerous, ti dangerous times we've had in America in decades. Okay, cool. So if World War III happens, what happens to the economy? Who's going to be the parties involved? Are we going to be involved purely through proxy or is there going to be attack here? Then you write down the possibilities. Okay. If this happens, what are you going to do? If this happens, what are you going to do? Then next, what happens if unemployment all of a sudden goes to 7%, 6%? What happens if inflation goes down? What happens if Powell starts lowering rates back down to 5 4%? Holy shit, that's, that's going to be crazy. What happened? So you got to write all of these different scenarios down. But here's a couple things that we have to be thinking about. And you said, which was fascinating. One, so credit card debt, highest it's ever been. You know what's the craziest thing about uh, uh, credit card debt being, being the highest it's ever been? Tom, the average interest rate on credit card is the highest it's ever been. Jesus. Forget about the debt. So people are worried about the debt. So imagine the interest rates in the last five years has gone like this to 23%. Or the average is 23% on credit card. You know what 23% means. That means the debt doubles about two and a half years. That's like loan shark. Th numbers. That's loan shark. Three years, your debt is doubling, right? But that's what we got right now on credit cards. Okay, so our debt is record-breaking. The uh, forgiveness for your uh, loan, uh, school loan, loan, is gone. So now you have to start paying for it. That's three, $400 a month that people are expecting, I think, October, November starting. Then let's set that part aside. Go to the corporations you were talking about that are borrowing money. This year, their interest payment on corporation that borrowed money is going to end up being around $530 billion, just interest. Oh, my God. Next year, it's going to 730 Next year, it's going to $1.1 trillion. In the next five years, it's going between $1.3 to $1.5 trillion just on the corporate debt that we're talking about. By the way, next part. Car payment, A credit, no one's affected. Good credit. They're making the credit payments on time. Mortgages, we're not saying anything crazy with people with bad credit not making payments. We're still good. Car payments and subprime, they're seeing a spike in defaults where people are not making car payments. The first sign you're seeing on what's taking place. No problem. Let's go to the next one. That's the scariest one. U.S. has $33 trillion of debt, worse it's ever been, the highest it's ever been. No problem. What does that really mean? No, I can really figure it out. Here's what it means. Of the money that we have, about eight trillion of it, the rates are gonna recalibrate and we're gonna have to have new rates that we're going. Every single time the rates go up one point, just one point for the US government, our interest payments, Tom, increases by $320 billion. Jesus. So imagine we raise rates by Three points, just interest, it's a trillion dollars more per year. If it's 6%, two trillion dollars more per year. That's that. Then last thing that I'll just kind of get you to be thinking about. Um, so anytime you want to know if the economy is back to normal, go to Vegas. If Vegas is humming, like, okay, we're good. And always, whenever you go to Vegas, talk to cab drivers and talk to the drivers who are doing Uber. Always ask, how's conventions doing? How are you seeing with traffic? Are you noticing things canceling? No, this has been crazy for us the last three months. Everything's good. But if they start seeing a downturn, they're typically an indicator of what's to come. Transportation industry, we consult for a lot of transportation companies at Bedevi Consulting. One of my friends, I'm about to go meet with them right after this. It, it, their, their, cons, their construction company does very well. We have these three clients that we have who are doing transportation. Two of them are doing 100 million, 80 million a year. Numbers are down 40, 50%. One of them is doing a billion a year. Their re revenue is down 70%. Oh. 
So let's actually talk about transport. Why would transportation be down 70%? Aren't Walmart, Amazon companies ordering stuff to ship it from here to there? Why would that be lowering? What do they know that we don't know? Again, these are people who have data to insider stuff that we can sit there and say, these are great indicators when you're studying these things on what's going on. Does this mean recession is going to come here? Like I told you earlier when we were talking, my bigger fear is a reverse market crash, which Venezuela just went through, which all of a sudden the rates get lowered and Dow and S&P goes. And Dow goes from 33, 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, just goes vroom. Is that just the dollar losing its purchasing power? Yes, exactly. That's what happens. The more we're printing, like, uh, uh, for example, a Michael Jordan... Um, card uh, years ago, a BGS nine and a half sold for seventy eight thousand dollars. I was like, "Oh my god, that's crazy!" But then all of a sudden, all of these boxes kept entering the marketplace of nineteen eighty six Fleer. Hmm. So guys started buying these things, and they were sending more to get graded at Beckett and PSA. The more they got cards graded, that seventy eight thousand dollar card BGS nine and a half became a sixty thousand dollar card. $50,000 card, $40,000 card, $30,000 card. You can probably buy a BGS 9.5 today for $20,000, $25,000, okay? So the inventory increases the more we print money. The more you print dollars and it's more accessible, the less it's value, the less it's worth. So these are some things that's going on uh, today. Uh, so, I, you know, like I, you, you sit there and you're like, okay, so does this mean guys are not going to make a lot of money? No, no you're going to see the first trillionaire in the next 24 months because none of this is going to affect the guys at the top. None of it. This printing money, every time they print money, the guys at the top make more money. Every, if there's anybody that should be against printing money, it's low- and middle-income families. If there's anybody that should be against printing money, it's them. If there's anybody that's for printing money, guess who it is? The guys at the top. Why? Because the poor and middle America can't keep money. They spend it, and when they spend it, what do they buy? A product owned by somebody in the S&P 500 or other people who have businesses. Money flows up. They can keep printing money all they want. So when low- and middle-income families are like, look at these guys, all they care about is themselves. Let that bill pass for $2.7 trillion. You simply look at them and you say, you have no clue how money works. You have no idea how money works. Guess what? Let's print $10 trillion. Rich are okay with it. You ain't going to get the rich complaining about printing $10 trillion or $5 trillion. BlackRock's going to be like, all right, cool. We're at 8 to $10 trillion of money in our ETFs, and we're buying up a bunch of different companies. We're buying up all these properties today. Right now, it's going to be nothing. But in the next few years, you have to go through us, and we dictate the market, and we're going to own it all. And what are you going to do about it? You know, this, th- these, are, these are a lot of different moving parts that is going on to me. And again, for me... Um, the, the idea of middle America not being able to make the money they need to make to be able to afford a house, send their kids to school, live in a nice place, enjoy some of their dreams, maybe not the biggest ones, but some of their dreams are going to become a reality. Middle America is getting smaller and smaller and smaller every single time we print money. For people that don't understand the mechanisms of printing money, it goes like this. You are you have to have a mechanism by which you put this new money that you created out of thin air by fiat, literally just saying, it now exists. Uh, you have to put it into the system. The way it's put into the system is by buying assets because typically low and middle income people don't buy assets, they buy products like you were saying, then they aren't beneficiary of that unless there are stimulation checks. Now those they will get sent directly to them. So there are ways to put it in their pocket, but what you're effectively doing is socializing losses. So you are spreading the loss out across everybody because while I get it that, because I own assets, I'm going to be disproportionately either protected or actually gain. The gain isn't real. And so it's really, I'm looking at the price is going up and it makes me feel like, oh, I really did something. But in the end, I didn't. In the end, it's just my dollar buys less. And so it takes more dollars to buy the same thing because nothing fundamentally 
happened. The business that I own a piece of did not become more productive and therefore can actually generate more by adding more value to the world. So once you understand that, like I actually, as a wealthy person, do complain when people print money because I'm like, hey, there is a point at which you break everything because the money is just going to hyperinflate and it isn't only going to be the stock market that goes up it's going to be the cost of bread and gas and taking your family to That's a right. movie and all of that and so um look i i'm conflicted in fact patrick bet david you're going to educate me here i'm conflicted about money printing because the only reason i got into doing financial content and quite frankly learning about financial content or finance in general uh was because of COVID. When COVID happened, this was me not being very far out from having worked at Quest. And I had a thousand employees in the inner cities. And I was like, they're all going to get obliterated. I'll be fine. I'll still be rich on the other side of this, but they're going to get wiped out because I didn't know money printing. I didn't know that they were going to socialize losses. And in doing that, that actually kept us from going into something that probably should have been worse than the Great Depression. And they money printed their way out of it. And we ended up being okay because it was spread across a lot of people. Now, I hate that I was taxed without, um, without it being acknowledged as a tax. And I feel that I've paid an inordinate amount of money. But if that's what stops everybody from going into a horrendous depression, I don't know. I don't know that it was a bad idea. But I know that it, because I am such a student of Ray Dalio, I know that governments, once they start money printing, they can't stop. And every time in human history that has been used as a tool, it's used until it breaks, until it breaks every time without exception. And that typically as it's racing towards breaking, I think it's what, eight out of the last 14 times it's ended up in a hot war. So usually as the debt, the big debt cycle, go watch Ray Dalio's video, as the big debt cycle comes to an end and, and uh, it, money's inflating away to nothing, debt is completely out of control, nobody can make their payments, everybody's defaulting, you have to have a complete reset of the wealth, which is, I think, why everybody calls this the great reset or the big reset or whatever. Because we are, we are actually stopping, we are forestalling catastrophe right now by printing, but we are only forestalling it. And nobody, I've had a lot of people on the show, nobody can tell me how you pull out of this death spiral other than austerity, and no one's gonna do fucking austerity. Yeah. Well, I mean, Ray, when he uh, uh, did that one video, if you've never seen that one video, it's like 32 minutes where he explains the history of money and mm -hmm. finance and what's going on if you, it's, by the way, it's got like 20 or 30 million views. Very few 32 minute uh, finance videos are gonna have that many views. Everybody must watch it. but. Yeah, so how can you fix this thing? Well, the the question, my question would be, is it a how do you fix this thing in a year? No one's going to know how to fix it because it's not going to happen. How do you address this and make progress towards, you know, getting better that they, over a 20 year span? Okay, now we're talking. 40 year span, even better. Then you have to forecast and see what solutions are going to be needed the next 20, 30, 40 years. The problem with America today is the following. Here's one of the problems with America, which, by the way, is a beautiful thing, but it's also a problem. Whoever that gets elected, we have cyclical cycles, okay? You got Carter gets elected, then it's Reagan Sr., then you have Clinton, then you have Bush, then you have Obama, then you have Trump, then you have Biden. So Republican, Democrat, Republican, Democrat, Republican, Democrat. So every time you do this, every eight years, the system is like changing, so cycles are changing. Whatever you're doing is changing. So you can't really consistently build on a philosophy over a 20-year period because in America, you, you can't put a 20-year plan in place. Mm. There is no such thing as a 20-year plan in America because whoever's the next guy that's going to come take your job is going to say, no, we're not building that wall. No, we're not going to do that. No, we're going to cut those benefits. No, we're going to add these benefits. No, we are going to spend more money. No, we are going to do that. No, we are going to leave this war. No, we are going to get into this war. The, these things... The, the, the complexity of what we're asking about is challenging because no one leader is going to run for 20 years. We just don't have that. Okay. Would so you I, want it? In a, in a way, when it comes down to the economy, uh, yes, I would want it selfishly for me and you because we're alive today. 
is it good for America long term? Absolutely not. Okay, absolutely not. Because if that one person's a shitty person that gets into office for 20 years, this thing's gone. It's destroyed. Okay, so at least this allows us to not be able to go super extreme because you have to get it through Congress and Senate, and it's already complicated enough to do that. But to fix this thing, you're never going to have both sides agree uh, philosophically, economically, on yeah. what they're going to be doing over a 20 year span. All right, let's go to the next side that we're talking about while all this stuff is going on. You have uh, um, the, the war right now with uh, China and India that is also taking place with iPhones are now being made in India. You can now get iPhones where on the back of it it says made in India. First time. Not made in China. It says made in India. Really? Guess who blocked TikTok in their country? India. Guess who's blocked 100 apps of China? India. Hmm. India is not afraid of China. Now, why does China not like India? Why do they always behind closed doors talk shit, yet at the same time they're part of BRICS? You got Brazil. You got Russia. You got India. You know, you got China. And I think it's South Africa that's yeah. part of the BRICS, right? Okay. So they're part of the same thing, but there's also a way of, you know, competing. The reason why I like India a lot, and I think India is going to play a very important role here, is because India has seen how China negotiated with U.S., and they've realized we're not doing that. But India has also seen the mistakes China made with the one-child rule and overexpansion and what's going on with a lot of these properties that they build out in cities that looks like just like Paris. I don't know if you've seen the city they build in China. It's a city. Everything Paris has, it has. Hmm. It looks identical to Paris. If you Google this. The same this, kind of architecture? If I tell you, if I show you the picture, you would think it's Paris. They spend billions of their own money to build a city replicating exactly Paris. That's what China did. Okay. Wow. So we're talking about, you know, the whole everything. Everything they have, they have a Champs-Élysées, same exact model that That's they have over there. So exactly. Bizarre. When you see the pictures, like when we're done, I can't wait for you to see these pictures to see what that looks like. So China overexpanded very quickly. India's watching. China, they had their one-child uh, one policy. The average age of a Chinese per, uh, right now is 38.4 years old. India is 27, 28. Wow. Okay. India's uh, IIT Institute is producing incredible engineers. Many companies here will hire Indian mm. engineers, and they're rock stars, better than MIT in many cases. So I think India is very important for the next 20, 30, 40 years. Very important. As long as India is there, China's going to hate it. They, they, they're not going to like it. The fact that Tim Cook right now has got a very hard job. I think Tim Cook, in a span of four weeks, lost $350 billion of valuation for Apple oh. in four weeks. $350 billion, okay? One, because iPhone 15 didn't do what they expected it to do. Mm -hmm. Two, because China is now giving them a hard time because China is their number one market of iPhones they sell. Mm -hmm. Now China's sitting there saying, wait a minute, we sell more iPhones in this country than anywhere else, yet you're giving our business to India? Who the hell do you think you are? Right. Then on the back end, the real war that's taking place is the semiconductor chips, and there's different levels to the semiconductor chips that's being built, and China's specializing in the cheapest kind to make the easiest kind to make, where some countries have specialized on the tough kinds to make when it comes down to semiconductor chips. This is why China can't stand Taiwan being there. This is why China wants Taiwan, because Taiwan specializes in building the extremely technical semiconductor chips that the rest of the world uses. And then there's complete other aspects to this that you can get even deeper on. So Taiwan's going to play a very important role. You know, we can't have a Russia-Ukraine or a uh, you know, Israel, Palestine, Gaza, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Turkey. We can't have that taking place with uh, Taiwan. Taiwan needs to stay separate. That needs to stay protected. How we do that, I don't know how we're going to do that. We're getting involved in one too many wars. But if, if Taiwan stays free and China relies on them because China destroyed the world during COVID, absolutely destroyed. We realize 80% of medications being built there, 80% of the technology that we need is being built there. They controlled everything. Car pricing, use prices went up 50%. Like, what are you talking about? You mean to tell me I bought this car for $90,000? It's used. You're willing to pay me $130,000? Yes. Are you serious? Yes. Why? We don't have chips to make cars. Are you kidding me? No. Rolexes, they were making Rolexes for 18 months. They didn't have equipment to make Rolexes. You'd go to a Rolex shop, they had one, one watch. Like, what do you have? We only have one watch. Can I order Rolex? No. It, we're in 12 months. You're not going to get it. Are you serious? Yes, nothing. This is what was going on at Rolex store. So... 
again, the stuff that gets me optimistic is India, is Taiwan, is we're committed to the semiconductor business here. Uh, the things that concern me is China, is Erdogan being wanting to be involved in the Israeli war, because most people don't realize the most powerful military in the Middle East is not Israel. Israel is powerful, but Israel has 300,000 soldiers, of which I think 150 is reserve. Turkey has nearly 400 active, 350,000 active soldiers, the number one military in the Middle East, if Turkey gets involved. You know, so we have all these dead things that we're looking at. Obviously, the military industrial complex, which Eisenhower talked about, where be careful with these companies like Raytheon and Boeing and General Dynamics and these guys that are making a lot of money when there's wars. We have to be careful with that taking place. We have to be very careful with that when that's taking place. But uh, yeah, it, it, it's very complicated, very complex. Ray Dalio says a depression could be possibly around the corner. Uh, a lot of these guys are fearing what is taking place today. Michael Burry shorted the. S&P 500, $1.6 billion of his client's money. And now he did it in a way where, you know, you're kind of protected, but still he's not optimistic about the S&P 500, what it's going to be doing. Uh, one too many moving parts for us to sit there. What will happen? The rich are still going to get rich. The innovators are still going to find a way to, you know, win. The people who learn how to use AI on their side, they're going to advance and excel even more. The acceleration and the disparity between the rich and the poor is going to get wider and wider and wider. Why? Because most people are going to spend majority of their lives on Instagram, on YouTube, on TikTok. They're not going to learn a new skill set. They're not studying AI right now. They're not studying technology right now. They're not learning new skill sets right now. Harvard did an article, Harvard Business Review, did an article saying to stay competitive right now, every 18 months you have 10 new skill sets to learn as an executive. It wasn't like that. It used to be 10 new skill sets every five years. Mm. Now we have to learn 10 new skill sets every 18 months. How the hell do we keep up? So, so that, this is the part where, you know, we talk about the only the paranoid survival. Like right now you have to be looking at this shit's out there. What part of it do I control? What part of it do I have not, no control over? If not a billionaire or a hecta or a deca millionaire, man, I got to figure out a way to increase my market value or else I'm going to get crushed. You're going to over the next 10, 20 years. If you're going to spend more time on Netflix, more time watching all these shows, more time playing all these games, more time watching all these TikTok, Instagram, if you're going to spend more time on that than building value for yourself and learning new skill sets, yes, the market's not going to favor you the next 18 to 36 months. But if you do that, fortunately for that community, they're going to be okay. This doesn't mean a recession is still not coming though. Okay, so let's start pulling apart some of the issues. So the geopolitical part of this comes down to, is there something that we can do to position ourselves? Um, uh, you were talking earlier about we create a matrix and it's like, okay, do we go to war? How bad is it? Yep. Like all the different scenarios and we run through them. Um, so, but let's sort of put the pieces on the table. We have um, global conflict. Mm -hmm. And that's going to do what it's going to do. And we need to think about what the plan of attack is there, or how we position ourselves well. We have the debt crisis, which is just probably the thing that weighs the heaviest on my mind. It seems the most inevitable. And because it's so in plain sight and not at all sexy, but nobody's freaking out, that one makes me the most nervous because you can just run the math and it seems inevitable that it things have to break for that to work. Um, You've got the, what we'll call the cold war of manufacturing and where that's going, Apple, China, India, all competing. But ultimately, how do people begin to actually put together a battle plan? So one of the, you, you had a really good video about advice for young men. And one of the things that you said was you need to be aware of what's going on. And I really woke up to that at the beginning of COVID. COVID was a grand a uh, moment where it's like, look behind the curtain, there's the Wizard of Oz. And I began to see how things were actually um, happening. That was very revelatory. And just as if you wanna be an entrepreneur, the ironic advice that I'm going to give you is you need to learn about the body. Because if you can get control of your body, if you can change your physique, you're gonna find discipline, consistency, you're gonna see that it really adds up to an actual transformation and you can apply all of that to um, business. Ones are, yeah, to business, to anything really. 
Once you begin to understand how the world actually works, now you can begin to position yourself to weather any storm. But you really do have to understand how the pieces move around the chessboard, how you're being manipulated. Um, and I don't, it certainly has not then provided me a sense of clairvoyance and, oh, I know exactly what to do, but I feel like it makes me ask a better caliber of question. To me, the caliber of question right now is what is the position someone should be working themselves into? So I'll paint the picture that I think, and then tell me if you disagree, if there's a better thing. Okay, number one, I think because only the paranoid survive, there's actually two things you need to be paranoid about right now. Paranoia number one is you can pull out of the market too soon and miss real opportunities. And since no one is gonna be able to accurately forecast the timing, you have to be thoughtful about that. So one strategy might be just that you dollar cost average in every day, make sure that you have a certain amount of savings so that you're not gonna find yourself in a panic situation. And as Morgan Housel said, uh, the, the whole purpose of having cash in a bull market is to make sure that you don't have a forced sale in a bear market. Now, I thought that was a, a really wise way. So uh, what I'm gonna present to people is there's so many variables on the table and I don't know how they're gonna go. I just want you to be in a position where you have optionality. So we're going to optimize for options. To do that, you're going to want to be largely in um, cash and index funds, which is not gonna sound sexy. And when I say cash, I'm talking money market, treasury bills, something like that. Five points right now. Yep, yep. which is fucking amazing. Yep. yep. All day, every day, I'll take it. Uh, now would not be the time, in my opinion, to invest in anything where you're not just an absolute complete expert, where you have so much disproportionate knowledge that you're able to really recognize a deal when you see it. So I've heard you talk a lot about some commercial real estate stuff that you're looking at because you know things are gonna go on sale. You, oddly enough, I still find this so fascinating, you really understand the baseball card market. So you'll know a deal when you see a deal. So it's like that to me, optionality, cash, um, only investing either sort of blindly in index stocks, not just completely removing yourself because you could miss you know, it could be six months, a year before, two years before this is, who, who knows? We really can't predict it. But that we are in a time of such volatility that if you are not taking every step with sort of maximum paranoia, uh, you're making a mistake. So that's, I'm sure if somebody were here, they'd have a lot of questions for that, but that's my rough guidance to myself. I think that was fantastic. I think it was fantastic and we're very aligned. Look, I mean, here, here's also the thing, right? Like where, you're, you're sitting there watching some of these guys sitting on a lot of cash. Why are they sitting on a lot of cash? Are they sitting on a lot of cash in, in, in case shit hits the fan? Is that what they're doing? Or are they just kind of sitting on a lot of cash wondering, I don't really know what's going on. When I say people, I mean Berkshire Hathaway. I mean, these, these guys have a lot of cash right now. They're sitting on the table. And, uh, you know, maybe they're not buying value stocks yet because they don't yet believe value stocks are here, Berkshire Hathaway, okay? If you're not in this business, if, if you're not in the business of investments, financial advisor, broker, day trader, don't play around. Do not play around and get crazy about it. Um, crypto, a lot of people got into crypto and NFT, and that was not their world. They didn't know about it. They lost a lot of money. I mean, a couple of guys made $90 million, but the people that bought their stuff lost $89 million, mm -hmm. but they got their money. There's a lot of guys that made the money in NFTs, but... It was a gamble for everybody. And everybody's like, oh my God, but I believe it and all this other stuff. Okay, great, that's pretty crazy. You know, what about this and what about that? Now, does that mean NFTs are going away? Absolutely not. My kids still buy stuff on Roblox and skins and all that. There's an element of it that is not going to go away. Guaranteed. Is there 95% of the NFTs that are not coming back? Yes, probably. Some of them are gonna be gone. Again, my opinion. I, I have interest in things I know about, and I'm interested in, like right now, you know, I'm looking at stuff, the card market got destroyed the last six months, destroyed. Guys are sitting on big cards, they were thinking they're gonna make a lot of money on it, they're not right now, okay? Cars that would've sold for $2 million two years ago are selling for $400,000 today. Wow. But they're gonna end up selling for that value. They're not going away because it's art. It's non-duplicatable assets. You can't duplicate these pieces, especially if it's things that are very few of, okay? So if one of one, they're not gonna go away. Art, Jamie Dimon's got a $900 million art collection. Why? 
Dave, Dana White is telling me about a picture he has in his uh, office. He showed me this yesterday that he paid $200,000 for it. That picture is probably worth eight to $10 million today. Art, money in art being made, again, non-duplicatable assets are very, very valuable. Whatever there's few of, very valuable. But only touch it if you know a lot about it. If you don't, don't even get close to it. If you love coffee and a little bit of caffeine, but hate the jitters and that afternoon crash that comes with it, there is finally a coffee replacement that you've got to try. It's from Peak and it's called Nandika. Nandika is made from the highest quality ingredients and claims to activate your metabolism, promote healthy levels of testosterone production, and provide sustained energy without the jitters or a crash. With slow release caffeine that comes from fermented probiotic tea Nandika delivers an energy boost that lasts throughout the day so you can stay focused and productive. Peak has well over 15,000 five-star reviews and for a limited time you can get up to 15% off plus a free rechargeable frother and cup with my link peaklife.com slash impact. Click the link in the description or go directly to peaklife.com slash impact to get up to 15% off plus two free gifts. If you know nothing about crypto, don't even get close to it. Don't get too crazy. Oh my God, I'm hearing, you know, Bitcoin's going to go to 100,000. It may go to 500,000, but don't do it because you're guessing because somebody else said it. Do it because You've done a lot of due diligence in it. So if you don't want to have that kind of a risk tolerance, indexing is the way to go to play it safe. Now, uh, to, to the small community of crazies that have an itch and a tolerance for madness, okay? This isn't everybody. This is some. When you have a certain amount of money, I'm talking to my Goldman guy. He comes in. We're having our conversation. He says, hey, here's what I think we can do with this amount of money. I said, okay, what about it? He says, here's a strategy we can use the next 90 days. I said, okay. I said, do you have any questions for me? He says, I got one question for you. Are you okay if in the next six months we lose $55 million in this? What a great question. Just straight up. And I'm like, mm, no, I'm not okay with That's this. That's a big nut. He says, uh, no problem. Totally get it. Then we can't go the way that this is one of the options we can go on. Because... What do you think about a chance of a World War III happen next six to 12 months? I don't know, man. I don't know if I'm at 50%, but I'm at 10%. Well, 10 is pretty high. Yeah, I agree. Okay, if that happens, how bad is it going to be? You know, like during COVID, that went to 18,000. I don't know if you remember for that minute that that went to 18,000. Everybody was like, holy shit, what's going on? But very quickly, went back to 32,000. So it recovered very quickly. Okay, so what does this mean? If you think a possibility of craziness is going to happen, that you keep cash and it happens, you can buy in dollar cost average. Okay, yes. You think you're that brilliant that you can time it? Historically, very few people have been able to do it. And those who did got purely lucky. Do you want to be part of that camp? Because most people, historically, what happened to them? They missed being in the market on the five best days. Right. And missing those five best days ended up costing them the difference between making... 13% over a 20-year period to making 7.8%. Correct. And that's a lot of money, by the way, between those two. So if that's not the world you want to play, don't do it. Don't at all do it. For me, the game we're playing is a different game. The game is there's going to be a lot of assets for sale the next couple of years, okay? And if you've made the right choices and you have cash and some of these assets – don't perform the next couple of years. There's the opportunity to pick up assets. There's the opportunity to pick up small businesses. I'm talking to a guy who runs a, you know, a, a, a business that they're doing 34 million a year. And he, I said, how many companies are there in the marketplace that you could buy right now that are between five to $10 million? There's at least eight. How many of them can't stand you? One of them, we never talk. I said, okay, the other seven, how many of them love you? Three of them. Do the or four know you? They know of me, but we don't have a relationship. Get it close to them as soon as possible. Make the follow-on phone call. He says, what do I tell these guys? This is what the call sounds like. Hey, John, listen, man, we're both in the same industry. How's business? And you'll know by their answer how it's doing. And you're going to say, oh, great. Unlike XYZ, we did 32% last month over last year. Okay, great. Guess what? That's not who you want to talk to. Next call, you got six more left, Okay. Hey, Larry, how are things? 
Oh, um, yeah. I mean, look, I mean, some areas were doing good. Some areas, uh, why? What, what's going on? Did somebody tell you something? Okay. Boom. Check. What's the conversation? Larry, here's what's going on. The reason why I'm calling you. We're getting calls from guys in our space, and some of them are not, want, are not doing as well as they thought they were going to do, and they're about to run out of cash, and they're calling us because we have access to certain relationships and contracts and technology that they want to take advantage of. I thought just to give you a call because we're within the same space, are you in a place right now where you want to entertain possibility of a partnership where we can help you with our company or no? If no, let's, I'm not going to impose. But if you are, maybe we can have that conversation. Five second pause. Uh, you know, about nine months ago, I would have told you to go to hell. But uh, yeah, maybe we can talk. Perfect. Um, when do you want to come to the office? Or would you like us to come to your office? Would it be okay if we first met at a coffee shop away from everybody? No problem. Let's do that. Then he goes sit down. What's going on? Look, man. I don't know if I want to do because I heard this and I heard that and I heard this. I don't want to be ripped off and I don't want to be this and I don't want to be that. Bro, let's just see what we can do with the numbers. If we can, great. If we can, we'll support you. Go do your thing. Then the conversation starts. So there's different levels right now in the marketplace. If you have cash, a lot of it, companies are going to be for sale the next 3, 6, 12 months. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be a lot of opportunities for you to increase your market share within the industry. If not, you're somebody that doesn't have a very high risk tolerance. Do not screw around the next six, 12 months thinking you are Nostradamus and you can predict the future because the market's going to destroy you. It's undefeated. The real power is, because it's not enough just to be strong. It's not enough to be violent. You really do have to be able to calculate it. I saw the interview with Jared Kushner on Lex Friedman, mm -hmm. and Kushner said um, that Trump always liked to leave people with a 10% chance that he might nuke them which is horrible. I say it with a, a smirk because I get the showmanship of it, but there is something to the unpredictability, the no, the belief that that person is dangerous and that it is merely strategy that keeps them in check. There is something to that. No question. And at, at that level to pretend that that isn't real is to set yourself up for disaster. In fact, I'd like to introduce my favorite Thomas Sowell quote which my audience will have heard me say a gazillion times. The last 50 years have been marked by exchanging what worked for what sounds good. And that feels like a lot of the policies, a lot of the ways that we talk about young men, toxic masculinity, all of that is, it sounds nice. It would be nice if we lived in a world where everybody could just be kind and gentle, but we don't. And so you wear thin the armor of civilization when you teach men to be weak. You know how in families, there's typically the one person everybody fears and respects. When they die, there's chaos. And all of a sudden, you know, one person is taking advantage of this person or that person. My, my uh, mother, her, her family had some money. The moment her parents died, uh, one of her uh, 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 family members took over all the money and he abused everybody else. He says, you're not gonna get it, I have it now. But when mom and dad were alive, he couldn't do that. The moment they died, he bullied everybody mm -hmm. from the money that he got. That money was supposed to go to a few people, he took it all. And he gave crumbs to people, and he became that dictator. You're lucky I'm giving you this kind of money. No, no, that was their money. But because the parents didn't put anything on paper, he stole it from everybody, and he could do that. What's the moral of the story? When, when that alpha, when that leader is not present, bullies show up, mm. you know? So, so for us, again, like this is a very chaotic time. I don't know when this is gonna be released, you know, whether it's one war or the other war or this or that. Um, we're, we're one or two people away uh, of being offended uh, of World War III getting started. You know, you got 16 million to 18 million people died, World War I, you know, 60 million on two, Third one, if we go at this trajectory, it could be 200 million. The, the, the job that we have collectively is to try to do whatever we can to turn down the temperature, not increase it. You know, if, if you and your wife get into an argument and you call me and you say, you won't believe what she said. My job isn't to say, she said that, Tom? Oh, dude, if she would have said that to me, it's done. Are you kidding me? Doesn't she realize how amazing you are? How lucky she is to have you? Instead, it's to say, Tom, come on, bro. 
she loves you. And you know you love her. And she's partly right, bro. I'm going to take her side. How could you say something like that? You're not on my side. You're on her side. Probably on this one, but I'm telling you privately. I'd go back and try to make this work. Screw you, Pat. Totally get it, bro. Let me know if you want to talk later. You get off the phone. I have a job. And it's called Doug. Diffuse, unify, and be the glue. We don't have a lot of Dougs around the world today. We have division today. We have divisiveness today. So, but if there's that one strong personality leader of the free world, a Churchill, a Reagan, a person you don't want to mess with, the world is typically a safe place. Yeah, that is, um, it, it is maybe a balanced place where the level of danger that is always ready to pop off is currently held at bay. Um, but I think the the reason that that cycle works where strong men make good times, good times make weak men, so on and so forth works is because when things are good, the seed of its own instability is present because of that loop. And I don't know that there's any way to escape it. It's one of the things that makes this so predictable. I agree. Now, Churchill's a fascinating character. In fact, this will be fun because I never get anybody that can talk about Churchill. I absolutely am just blown away by Churchill. And you can say what you want. And did he have his flaws? Of course he did. But this is a guy that felt he had let his country down in a uh, military. This is World War I. Uh, he makes a mistake leading the Navy. And he says, OK, I know exactly how to come back from this. I'm going to, even though he could have just gone back to England, he says, no, put me on the front line. And so he goes to the front line and he said other people didn't want to walk with him on the night patrols because he would just talk out loud. And they're like, bro, we're going to get shot. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> and he, he uh, said to his mother, I have such a need to earn a reputation for physical courage that I'll basically do anything. And so he stays on the front line, multiple times narrow, narrowly escapes getting killed, sees countless people die around him and said to himself, okay, now after, I forget how long, but it was a long time, again, all voluntary. Uh, he's like, now I've earned my way back to parliament. And he goes back to England and re-engages in government life. And I just thought, whoa, like, I'm not even saying I could do it, but I'm saying I admire it. And I'm saying that men ought to have that kind of courage. And that to me, we've had 70 years where we really, on our own soil, where we have not had to face um, violence and danger. I'm not taking anything away from the men and women that have served um, overseas, obviously. But there's something that still let our country's psyche be lulled into the sense that we don't need men standing on the wall protecting us. And that worries me. Military, meaning we don't need a military? Yeah, basically. I mean, so uh, I was quoting the uh, line from A Few Good Men, where he's like, men like me. And the thing is, I hope what we are supposed to take away from that is that he's a complicated character. And yes, some of the things he did were despicable, but he's also right. And that's what keeps them from being a caricature is you, you are asking people to risk being shot. You're asking them to kill other people. I mean, it, it is horrific, horrific. And there is, there is an evolutionary seed inside, certainly inside the male brain that makes that very possible. You know, if, if there's anything like any man that wants to earn, forget about, you know, should I go become rich? Should I go have a six pack? Should I be in shape? Should I do this? If you pursue anything, if you earn moral authority, you, you're gonna have a lot of self-respect. You'll have self-respect in the way you lead your wife and your kids. You'll have self-respect in the companies you lead. And you'll have self-respect in a community. Does this mean you're going to be a billionaire? Not necessarily. Does it mean you're going to be a millionaire? Not necessarily. But if you earn the right and you have that moral authority, there's something to earning that. That takes years. That doesn't happen overnight. I mean, when you're telling the story with Churchill, there's something to it. There's something to, you know, a guy setting the pace from the front. There's something to earning the right, you know, there's something to it. This is why for me with the voting system that we have, I think our voting system is totally screwed up in America. A couple areas of it, I'm not a fan of it because for me, I, I would much rather have a 16 year old kid who has a job working at McDonald's, 
who made 20 grand last year and paid three thousand dollars in taxes i want him to vote over the 25 year old bum living with his mom and dad not going to school not getting a degree not doing anything for him to vote i don't want this guy to vote i want to hear from this 16 year old kid let this guy vote it, our, our system is too much of yeah here you go yeah here you go now earn the right to vote why don't you earn the right to vote well, just by being an American, don't I earn the right to vote? I totally get it. But you got to have some, you like pull your little red wagon. How are you going to contribute to society? Well, that you're discriminating against. Dude, I'm from Iran. I was born in Iran. Uh, half Armenian, half Assyrian. I'm a one point GPA kid. I'm a welfare kid. I'm not a kid that came up here was going to be something. But I wanted to come back and earn the right to say, hey, I want to earn this respect that America gave to me. I want to go do my part. I think we have to go more towards that in our house, our kids. You know, it, it, everybody's talking right now about having a phone. I don't know how many articles I've read that the more you delay your kids getting a phone, the more happier they're going to be. By the way, parents, if you're watching this, do yourself a favor and go watch the movie Disconnect. Disconnect, I, I don't have a phone to see who's the actor, but one of the guys is the, I don't know if you've seen this movie or not. No. Disconnect is Bateman. What's his name? Is it Jason Bateman? Is that his that first name? Certainly yeah. is. So uh, the, guy. the guy, is that from Horrible Bosses? Yes. yes. Okay, so th that guy. This movie Disconnect is a story about a boy who, 12, 13, 14 year old kid, goes to school, there's a girl he likes. These two bullies knows he likes the girl. They create a, a Facebook profile with the girl's picture, befriend everybody in high school thinking that's the girl, but it's not. She DMs him on Facebook in the movie, this is 11 years ago, 2012, and says, hey, please don't tell anybody, but I really like you, I'm shy, I don't wanna tell others, but I like the way you are. Oh my God, I've loved you, da da da, and they're going back and forth. She says, I'll show you mine if, I sh if you show me yours. But it's the two boys. So the boys send a picture of somebody else they got from a porn site. He opens it. So he sends it. And then she says, but I want to see your face in it as well. So he does. The next day he goes to school. Everybody's laughing at him because those two bullies took the picture, spread it around the school. Then the boy runs away, comes home, is in his room listening to heavy metal music, is trying to hang himself. Daughter or sister walks in, prevents it from happening, and saves his life. And then they had to figure out how this happened because the parents weren't involved. There's so many different things going right now in society that we, we, have, to, we have to be aware of people earning stuff. Phones are dangerous today that you know, kids are picking up on what can happen to them. If you do, you have to educate them. If you do, you have to hold them accountable. If you do, you have to watch and see what's going on. But in our family, um, everything starts with earning. Uh, the currency in our house, I've talked about this, God knows how many times, is reading. You read, you earn the right. The more you read, the more you can ask for. If your grades are solid, you get to ask for more. If it's not, you don't. And people say, Pat, how could you have standards like that when you had a one-point GPA? What does that have to do with anything? I didn't have those standards. I simply grew up in a house that nobody cared what my grades were. There, there was never an expectation of me doing anything my grades. So guess what? I'm going to rise up to the standards of whatever, whatever it is as a, as a 14, 15, 16-year-old. There was no standards, so I was left alone. In our house, there is standards. There is expectations. You gotta perform to it. You do, you get more. So America started off as earning. We got away from that because earn is now another one of these curse words that people don't like to talk about. How could you say something like that? How could you say something like that? All you care about is money. All you care about is this. No, man, I cared about you being proud of the contribution you're making to society. Because the more proud you are of the contribution you're making to society, the safer the place is gonna be. The less you contribute to society, the more bitter you're gonna be, feeling like everybody owes you something, and then you could do something very bad to everybody else. So, yes, I think we need to go back to earning, like when you're telling the story of Churchill, to have that moral authority. Mm. It's very interesting to me. There's something super telling in the fact that people ask you, whoa, 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 how can you ask them to keep their grades up when you didn't keep your grades up? Because that reveals their value system. Now, I have a feeling that their value system, they've never taken the time to lay it out. And I think one of the biggest problems when I think about, okay, what's ailing men? How do we get them back on track? It's what is your value system? What do you, how do you believe a man ought to be? Write it out. Then at least we have something that we can actually talk about. When somebody says, how can you do that? You didn't have good grades. What they're going for, I assume, is fairness. The second your primary focus is on fairness, now we have a problem. So 
The reality is, of course, life isn't fair. And I don't mean that in any sort of cheeky way. It's just if you're trying to optimize for fairness, you're setting people up to try to say uh, the game is always going to be controlled. Go out there. You're going to be fine. And then they're going to get into a fight. And I don't mean a literal fight, but they're going to get into a fight for their business, a fight for a promotion, whatever. And it isn't going to play out fairly. And if in that moment they're emotionally devastated because they've been taught that everything revolves around fairness, they're going to be in trouble. If, on the other hand, we, and this is very specifically what Tom Billy wants people optimizing for. What is effective? So you have to have a goal. You have to know what your goal is. What am I aiming at? And then you're going to judge everything by whether or not it's effective. Did it actually get me towards my goal? Now I'm going to assume that your goal is honorable. If it's not, then we already have a problem. But assuming that your goal is honorable, now you can just is believing this, doing this, whatever, is it going to move me towards my mm. goal? If yes, I'm going to do it. If not, then I'm not. Do you know Jeffrey Canada? Mm -mm. Oh, Jesus. I've got to meet somebody that can help me get this guy on the show. I've been trying and trying and trying. And I have no idea that he will agree with me on anything. However, he has created the most effective school for kids. So he, uh, he will go into an underserved area. And in the same building that the school is already being run at and they're delivering kids that are like three years below in reading and graduating levels, just absolutely atrocious. He'll go into the same building with the same kids, randomly select students. So it's not even like a merit based anything, randomly select students and then put them into a merit based school system. And now it's like. Are you following our discipline rules? Are you doing your homework? Are you getting your grades? Like all of that. And if you do, you stay. And if you don't, you're out. Dude, the outcome by being regimented, by being disciplined, by saying you are going to live up to these standards. And of course, I'm sure they do it in a way that gets the kids fucking excited. The kids aren't like, oh man, like I have to pay attention. It's like, hey, if you learn this stuff, you can control mm -hmm. your life. You can get out of this neighborhood. Mm -hmm. You can go on to do whatever the hell you want. And that kind of because uh, again i i need to interview this guy to make sure my breakdown jeffrey of what he's canada done, jeffrey canada to make sure my understanding of what he's done is accurate but from what i can tell a big part of what he's doing is sidestepping the um the unions and so if he's got a bad teacher bye like you have to be good you have to be performant and so they just churn out graduates at like an insane rate. It, it's startling. And remember, these are the same kids that before they got moved in were failing, just abject failures. They do it in the same building. It's absolutely bananas. And that to me says, especially at that age, structure, discipline, the right value set, and helping people tap into, um, he, I, I have no reason to believe he would use these words. These are now my words and my interpretation of this that when you can show somebody how to generate ferocity in a controlled manner, ooh, now you've got something. Mm. Now you've got something. But most people can't find that gear. Yeah, that's pretty wild. But at the same time, I'm not surprised, right? I'm not surprised where a, you know, a, a Bill Walton, who's a hippie, goes into a system that they have with UCLA, and he comes in with his beard and his long hair, and he says, hey, uh, John Wooden says, uh, go get a haircut and then come back. You got to shave your beard and you got to cut your hair or else you're not playing. He said, I'm not getting a haircut. No problem. You ain't playing. So what are you talking about? Listen, kid, I know you're the number one pick in the country today because you're the best center in America today. You're not going to play for this team. He says, I got on my bike when I cut my beard, when I cut my hair, came back, and I think they ended up winning the champion, national championship, one or two of them. But... When John Wooden died, it, it, I was at the Ronald Reagan Library in UCLA. I think it's one of those in, in uh, uh, L.A. And uh, uh, one of my friends, Dudley Rutherford, is there. And we're in the waiting room. We're having a conversation. I'm about to make a big decision in my life. This has got to be, I could even tell you the date. It's got to be between June to September of 2009 when Reagan died. It has to be around those when uh, John Wooden died. And uh, 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 no, it's at, yeah, so somewhere around that season. Anyways, maybe a couple years after that. So I'm sitting there and I'm just watching former UCLA players, 6'7", six, 6'8", six, six, showing up, coming down the elevator, they're crying, leaving. Coming down the elevator, they're crying. Here's a man that impacted their lives. If you ever read books on him, his pyramid of success and things that he did, fascinating. This guy lived up to 99 years old because of how many people's lives he changed. But what we don't want as a young man 
as a young boy, that person that disciplining us eventually ends up being exactly what we want. I'll give you one here. Depending on the levels of audacity from the kid, I'm 18 years old, I'm in the army. We're just talking about this on the flight here. And myself and three other kids, we're from New York, LA, we're all acting like we're tough guys. We're not tough guys, but we're acting like we're tough guys. Like that story you were talking about earlier, uh, you use a certain phrase that, hey, you know, they're loud, but it's not really, they're not gonna do anything. Mm. We, we're thinking we're gangsters, we're tough guys, all this stuff. We're fighting each other in the laundry room, hitting each other, all this stuff. We don't have a clue what we're doing with fighting. We just have a lot of testosterone. But we're not listening to this guy, Drill Sergeant Green. One day he asks us to get into the Humvee. He says, I'm going to take you guys to the place. Get in there. We get in there. No problem. We're driving to the back 40. 30 minutes, 40 minutes. We've never been here before. He goes into a place. It's not on a road. Cool. Pulls up, gets out. It's not saying anything to us. Picture a guy that moves slowly like Bruce Lee, okay? Think about when he's not fighting. He's just moving like that. Takes his jacket off, his BDUs. Takes his hats off, hat off. Takes his uh, uh, dog tag off. And he says, who wants to go first? And we're like, what do you mean? So who wants to go first? I said, Drill Sergeant, what are you talking about? He says, if we fight here, no one will ever know. But we're going to fight. Who wants to go first? He's 5'8". Okay, we're all big guys. All right, but we have no clue what this guy's background is, but he's very confident. So one by one by one, we go in there casually. One by one by one, he beats the living shit out of us, except he's got one rule. Doesn't hit us anything up here. Mm. Everything is here. We're all on the ground begging him to stop. He took it to levels where he knew we were going to be able to do PT the next day, but not to the point where the public's going to know what just took place. And then we're done. He says, okay, you sure you guys are tough guys? No, drill sergeant. You guys going to be good moving forward? Yes, drill sergeant. You guys are gangsters? No, drill sergeant. We're privates. Get in the Humvee. Let's go back. We got on the Humvee. We went back. Let me tell you, I wish they would have recorded it. There's a picture of me standing next to him um, with me and my dad. <laughs> you could tell in that picture who ran the show. Mm. You could tell who was the alpha. He was the alpha. You know what that 18-year-old kid needed? That 18-year-old Patrick, that's exactly what he needed. I needed order. He was the first guy I faced that I couldn't get away with everything I was doing. He wasn't afraid of me. He put me in my place. Boys need that. God knows how many boys need that. Because let's just say that doesn't happen in my life. We're not having this conversation today. Let's just say I'm just like a regular guy. I don't get that discipline from somebody that challenges me. And he doesn't care from parents got a divorce. He doesn't care where I'm from. He has no sympathy for me. He's trying to lead me. That's his job to make sure soldiers are solid. So when war happens, somebody like me is going to be able to stand up to the enemy. But today, that would never fly. Today, he'd go to jail. Today, he'd be written about all over the place. Today, they would make a movie about him. And I would get a call from Disney saying, it's so unfortunate that he discriminated against you, that you're Iranian, Armenian, Assyrian, and you're brown. That's why he did that. We should go sue the army and we should make a movie about this and turn him to be a villain. He was not a villain. He was a leader. He, he, he made the world a better place by checking me very quickly at 18 years old. So as you're telling these stories and you're going through Jeffrey Canada, maybe his approach is a different approach. Maybe he's not going to use the approach that Drill Sergeant Green used with us. But at the same time, we need more people like, I don't know who he is, I don't know his standards, but based on who you're telling me, a guy like that, we need more men like that in America. Mm. Yeah, I'm with you. So how do we get going back in the right direction? In fact, talk to me about the military. So um, what's your confidence level in our current military? You know, there's certain things that I talk to my boys about that I don't want my wife around. And she doesn't want to be around. I said, babe, this is between me and them. You can't be here right now. I got to talk to these guys. And I will talk to them, okay? And she respects it. And we do our thing. Um, we got a couple rules in the house. I don't give the girls pow pows. They don't get pow pows. What are you saying? Pow pows. Pow pows. That's what we call in our okay. house. It's called pow pows. They don't get spanking. They don't get anything. The boys, it's a different story. They don't get it anymore but they know what can come. Um, and when I need to talk to these boys to put them in their place, 
I have to have the conversation privately. What's the point? If you've never been in the military, if you've never been to war, you, you have no understanding of what it takes to prepare somebody to defend. You have no idea what it takes to get somebody to defend. You've never done that before. So what does it mean? In war, when the other guy's trying to kill you, there is no, hey man, do you have your mask on? Because COVID, it could spread. How often are you checking your credit score, afraid of identity theft or account breaches? We all use the internet every single day for important things like personal banking and remote work. So why not protect yourself with our sponsor, Aura? Aura is an all-in-one cybersecurity service that keeps you safe online. Aura identifies data brokers exposing your info and submits opt-out requests on your behalf. Aura also monitors your credit, tracks your passwords for data breaches, and secures your online activity with VPN and anti-malware protection. You can try Aura for free for two weeks by clicking the link in the description or scanning the QR code. Hey, before we fight, did you take the vaccine? Because I can't fight you if you didn't take the vaccine. Hey, before we fight, what's your DI score in Russia? What's, what's the ESG score? You guys have all good, you guys, you guys good or, because we can't, it's inappropriate. Hey, what kind of weapons you guys use? Are these gonna make the climate dirty, the bomb? How are you not worried about the climate? How dare you have a weapon like this? So before you shoot us, let's check to see if that weapon you're using is climate friendly. That doesn't exist when a war takes place. When a war takes place, the other guy has one thing in mind. Either surrender or I'm killing you. That's what happens in war. So how do you psychologically prepare somebody for that? Well, maybe we should just prevent people from going to war. Totally agree. I'm not for it. I'm glad we didn't have it for a few years. It's just all of a sudden when we don't have fear, respect, and admiration for a leader in America, we have more wars. Okay? Everybody thought the last three years were going to be friendly and peaceful and we were all gonna get along. Forget about us getting along in America. The world can't get along the last three years, right? So how do we get back to it? We get back to it by the following manner. You got 50 employees here, give or take, uh, based on what, I, what people told me, and you build a good business, and you're doing very well. Okay, how many times, Tom, matter of fact, let me ask the question a different way. How many people, including Quest, including all the businesses you've ran, how many people have you hired? Personally? Actual employees that you personally have hired. I've interviewed 1,500 people. Okay. More now, because that's the, when I clocked that stat, it was like five years ago. But so yeah, I've interviewed 1,500. I've had 3,000 employees. I was involved in hiring probably 30% of them directly. Fantastic. You, you were the COO or whatever role you have, CMO or CEO. I think one of those roles lasted president, until yeah. president. Okay. So president has one of the hardest jobs because you're the COO and your, your ops, your data, you're all of that stuff. Okay, how many HR managers have you interviewed? Oh, Jesus. Um, interviewed, probably 25. Okay, so watch this. How many have you hired or have you had? Uh, four. Okay, so did you ever have an experience when you interviewed uh, your first HR manager, where the next one, this one didn't work, it prompted you to ask two additional questions on this one that you didn't ask on this one, and on the third one, you ask better questions than the second one, and oh, on the sure. fourth one, you ask better questions than the third one, right? Okay. So, first HR manager I'm hiring. It's like, we just need somebody to do the payroll, you know, total, right. so, you know, all this stuff, and, you know, check GNA, Insperity, ADP, who do we use, and $39,000, and do this, and blah, blah. Okay, great. Man, I'm so glad we got somebody handling all this payroll. And then, hey, we got a complaint here. 401k benefits, health insurance, cost going up. Is this good? I don't know. I don't care. Right. Next one. We need a better one. We need a better one. We need a better one. And COVID. COVID happens. We had a HR manager that was reactive to everything. And it's the end of the world. And it was causing everything in the office to be chaotic. Mm -hmm. I said, this is not going to work out. So I'm interviewing people. And here's how I'm interviewing people. I say, hey, uh, Mary, just out of curiosity. Let's just say in our licensing department, we have 20 employees there. One of the employees comes to you and says, I got a cough and I'm not feeling well. You tell this person to do what? Go get tested. Great. They get tested. They come back. It's positive. What do you do? What are your next three moves? Oh, send everybody home. Okay. I can't hire you. 
Second person comes in. And that just that answer alone, I already know you're not fit for this job. Next thing I go, comes in. Licensing department has 20 employees. One of the employees comes to you, they're coughing, they're not feeling well. You send them and they get tested positive. What do you do? What do I do? Yeah, here's what I do. I send an email to everybody in the company. I tell them such and such as COVID. If you'd like to leave, you can take a laptop and go home and work. Okay, great. Better answer, but still a little bit too much. Third person comes in for the interview. Hey, licensing department has 20 employees. One person comes to you, they're coughing, they get tested positive. What do you do? Um, I ask who in that department has been with them. If they have, I tell them they can go get tested. And then if that person's gone in the kitchen, I'd say who else was around you when they were, you know, in the kitchen or the bathroom, such and such. But have you shook anybody's hands? I've shook them. I'll go to that person and tell them that and ask them if they want to get tested, they can. And then if they bring back negative, come back to work. If not, totally get it. Okay, reasonable. We're hiring this person. So I started hiring people based on case studies. Where am I going with this? Your question is, how do we go strong like we used to because it's chaotic today? Here's the point. Next time you're picking a president, think about your hiring somebody for a job and ask better questions. One of the questions we need to hire today when we're wanting to pick our president or our governor is how to handle chaos based on what experience, not based on what they've said, based on what experience. What have they gotten done? What's their biggest accomplishment? How have they helped the economy? What do you want as a president? Do you want somebody that needs other people's money when they go run for office? Because the more people's money you take and the more they give, guess what comes with that? Nobody gives $10 million and says what? Yo, you know what? You don't owe me any favors. But here's $10 million. Don't worry about doing favors for me. In your super PAC, I'll give you $100 million, but I don't want any favors from you. That doesn't work that way. They'll give $100 million, and there's three favors in the back, and hey, you got to change those three laws to prevent this guy from competing with me. Any president that ever ran that needed the least money, the people of power hated. Mm. I'll give you a list of these guys. John F. Kennedy. His father funded 50, 40 or 50% of the entire thing. And then people wow. showed up, a big number. And by the way, he said, I'm willing to spend 100% of it. When he became president, who hated Kennedy's? It's a long list of people. Are you kidding me? The oil people, you got CIA, you got Federal Reserve. You want me to keep going? You know the story, you're a smart guy. There's a lot of people that didn't like that guy. Why? Because he didn't take money from anybody that they needed. They knew he could do it on his own. Reagan, his own financing, okay? You go Trump his own financing. You go Hillary Clinton, 100% other people's money. Biden, nearly 100% other people's money. That's a bit scary, okay? Kennedy was a Democrat. You know, Trump is a Republican. It's not like you're talking left or right. But maybe if, like, uh, when, when uh, you, you probably know the story with Steve Jobs when he started Apple, when he started uh, Pixar, right? Uh, he put $7 million of his own money into the company, okay? We're having a meeting yesterday with, with uh, Dana White, a two-hour meeting, nice meeting, and we're having a couple of the conversations about what could possibly happen, business dealings, all this other stuff. Guy comes to you. He says, Tom, we want to raise $10 million for this project we're working on. You're going to ask, we're going to ask probably the same questions. 80% will be the same question. 20% is going to be different. But what do you want to know so far? Who's the management team? What's their past? What's their background? What's different about this? What's their blue ocean? Do they already have a technology? Is there an MVP? What kind of results do you have? How many transactions have you done? Like our app, Manect, we've done nearly 10,000 transactions, 100,000 uh, times this app's been downloaded. We have revenue in the seven-figure mark. So we have a number to look at it. Now, I come ask you for $10 million. And you say, okay, what are you going to do with the $10 million? I tell you, oh, that $10 million, I'm going to take five off the table for myself and then we're going to take the other five, and I'm going to give myself a $500,000 of your salary, and we're going to pay this person this, and then the last $2 million that's left, we're going to put into technology. Are you giving that $10 million? No. Now watch this. What if I come to you and I say, uh, Tom, here's a product. This is our proof. This is what we've done. This is our leadership team. Here's our salary we're paying ourselves right now. The $10 million we raised from you and your camp, I'm taking zero salary. I don't want any salary. Nothing. And I don't want to take a penny off the table. We're going to take that money to put into technology. You're probably more open to the idea of entertaining this. And if I finish up with the following thing and I tell you, by the way, Tom, I have put $6.8 million of my own money into Manect. Mm -hmm. You're not going to say 6.8, 
doesn't even want to take 6.8 right now of the money he put into business. He's willing to do it later on. He wants to put 100% in, and he doesn't want a salary, and he doesn't want to change the salary in the company. You're probably going to sit there and say, what's the risk for me? There isn't. Let's talk about it. Let's get lawyers involved. Let's look at the deck. Let's get deeper, et cetera, et cetera. If a president comes in and they're running and they say, I'm putting X, Y, Z amount of my own money, that kind of gets my attention because you're risking your own capital as well. It, we, we, have to, we have to start asking, um, what do you have involved that you could lose if this thing doesn't work out? You know, as an investor, we have to look at hiring our president and our governors in that way. We've not been trained that way. We've been trained to just, he's been 30 years in public service. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, you know, 30 years in public service, we ought to give him respect. As a cop, cool. 30 years, I get it. Respect. 30 years in the military, salute to you, sir. 30 years as a firefighter, that's a tough job. You've been 30 years as Congress. What have you done for the economy? Who's your funders? Who's giving you money? We have to ask better questions. Now, most people don't want that conversation to be taking place, but I think our interview process of whoever we pick that come with the policies that's leading to the catastrophes we're experiencing, we have to be a little bit more selective of the presidents and the governors we choose. Let me ask you, do you see, because I think one of the real, um, one of the real roads, maybe it's a 0.1% chance, maybe it's a 70% chance. Uh, what do you think the odds that we are already in some sort of Roman empire-like decline? meaning already in it in that it will happen in the next 10 to 15 years? Um, I, don't, I don't know if we're there. I'm not, in, I'm not in the doom and gloom yet. Why? Because um, the great thing about capitalism is what? Here's the best thing about capitalism. Capitalism prevents you from doing stupid things because it's going to hurt your capital. Okay. When I recruited salespeople over the years, I gave score. There's a scoring system in this book, Choose Your Enemies Wisely, on who you can have your running mates. 15 qualities for running mates, and you score them based on six different qualities. Okay. I would look at guys, and I would say, which one of the people I work with is gonna give me the least amount of headaches. And here's what I learned, okay? Extremely good looking guys and girls, single in their 20s, gave me the biggest headaches. Why? Because everybody wanted to be with them and testosterone levels high at that level. And guess what? They're gonna fool around. You may be high one month and kill it. Next month, you're dating three girls in the office. And one of my best girls who made a lot of money last year, you just broke her heart. You left her for another girl, she can no longer come to the office because she's embarrassed and she right. left us to another company. So do that for about three years and then go see 17 therapists who have no clue what sales is like, then you're gonna realize, I have to change my approach. Mm. Then I'm sitting there and saying, man, that guy over there is so boring. Dude, he is so boring. Nothing's exciting about him. But he went from making $500 a month selling insurance $2,000 a month three months later, to making $2,000 a month three months later, to making $4,000 a month a year later. Then he's making $6,000 a month six months later. Then a year later, he's making $8,000 a month. Then three and a half years later, he's making $18,000 a month steady. Man, you are, there's nothing about you that inspires me. But you know what? Here's what I learned. He was married and he had kids. So what's the point? He has to make it work. He has to make it work because he has to protect those two kids that he has. Mm -hmm. He has a mortgage. He has to make it work. He can't go screw around. He's married. The likelihood of him going and clubbing and partying with all the other single people and smoking and doing ecstasy is lower. So I realized I have to invest my time in people who are the most bankable long term. Stable home, stable relationship, more things to live for more things to work hard for, more things that will prevent you from making stupid decisions. Perfect. Now bring that into the Roman Empire following all this other stuff. Okay. Jamie Dimon is not going to want to screw up what he's doing. 
And his legacy is going to matter to him because there's no way in the world he's going to let Sandy Weil be able to say, I told you guys, that guy Phil, he was a nobody. He's not going to let that happen. And he's running the most, you know, company that every day, $7 trillion, they see come in and out. J.P. Morgan Chase, right? Um, Apple, Amazon, Gates, Microsoft, these guys have assets. Are they going to let something crazy happen to it? I don't know. Musk who is standing up against the establishment, he's not okay with what the establishment's trying to do. And with social media, a lot of this bullshit's being exposed, whether it's talking about ESG and what BlackRock and, you know, they're trying to do or Open Society Foundation or these DEI scores, CEI scores, which California is famous for, they're getting exposed, right? And people are talking about it. So social media is allowing us to hold people accountable. I don't know if you saw what just happened right now this week with Supreme Court having a discussion to say social media companies cannot take anything off their websites Whoa! this week. So censorship at the highest level. You don't have the right to take anything down. People can post whatever they want. That's crazy if we go Whoa. that direction. Was it's, that a preliminary Preliminary. Judgment? It's not done yet. No, it's fully preliminary. You got to look into it. Yes. So you got my attention. So, so because Supreme Court is now what? 5-4, right? So now it's kind of like they can impose and kind of push the envelope mm. there. Okay, and they can protect sanity in America with some of the ways that businesses have been bullying people during COVID. COVID, what it did do, which was great, it was so awesome in one area. You know what it was? What's that quote? You know, absolute power, you know, uh, reveals what this person's driven by, right? You know, and, and Lincoln said, if you want to test someone's character, give them power and see what they do. Guess what? During COVID, who did we give power to? Fauci, CDC, California, New York, uh, governors of some states had a little too much power. They were like emperors pretty much, you know. Hey, if somebody in LA, you see them without wearing a mask, text this word and we'll find them and da 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 What are you talking about? You're paying people in LA to snitch on other people? It's a part-time job. What do you do for a living? I snitch. I make six grand a month. Mm. Really? Yeah. What an incredible way of making money. So during COVID, if we're not oblivious and not naive, we realize what the people of power really wanted to do. And we saw that in Europe. Everybody's walking around with their COVID passport and they're kind of doing this kind of stuff. Um, so to me, it was fantastic to really see them show their cards. Oh, this is what you're trying to do to America. We're not going to let that happen. What did that do? It got guys like Rogan to flip. I'm no longer on your side. You got guys like Elon Musk. Oh, so you were full of shit the entire time. I thought you were trying to do something good. Got it. I'm not part of your camp. I'm going to go by Twitter. Scott Galloway. This guy's full of shit. Professor Galloway, there's no way in the world he's going to buy. He's bluffing all of you. He's fooling all of you. There's no way he's going to buy Twitter. Elon Musk bought 100% of Twitter. And now Scott Galloway on Bill Maher last week with Andrew Cuomo saying, we need to show some grace. We were wrong during covid we were wrong during COVID. Wow. I'm sorry, Professor Galloway. Did you show grace? Did you show grace? Oh, now you want grace, but you never gave everybody grace. And you're this professor from New York who's had exits of a couple companies, and you've not taken salary from UC Berkeley. Respect to you. You simply go and do the work. I've seen the money you've given to Berkeley, three and a half, four million dollars, but you didn't have any grace. You didn't show people grace, so what happened now? But it was beautiful. You saw what universities were doing. Harvard got exposed during COVID. No more campus. You guys got to go home. Okay, so does that mean the annual tuition is still 60000 or is discounted to 20000 No, no, still 60000 What? For what? You're not giving me food. You're not giving me a place to stay. You still want me to pay $60,000. Yes, we do. Bingo, you just showed your true colors. Beautiful. That was fantastic. Hey, we want you guys to go and work from home. Really? Yes. All right, shit. So I'm uh, living in New York. I'm working for XYZ Company. They're paying me two hundred fifty grand a year. I can't live normal life in New York. I'll go live in Florida, work from home, except now I'm not paying the taxes. Oh, no, 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 no. We don't want you to work from home. Why now? I can work from home from Florida. No, we want you to come back to New York now. Got it. So you screwed up the policies, but now I'm in Florida. I'm not coming back to New York because I actually love Florida, and I'm stuck here. And people from California went and worked from home in Texas, and now they're saving at 13%. Now they're not coming back. So they were like, oh, people are going to come back. They never came back. Right. The people never came back. So this, this empire is falling. The great equalizer, Tom, is social media. 
if social media sticks around and they can't silence people from sharing their thoughts and opinions, I'm not talking about people getting up there and saying, we should go do this. I'm not talking about that. I'm saying, hey, what about this? And we start questioning things. Then the people of power that reveal their cards, not everybody, but the establishment that wants to control more of the people, they're like, yeah, we're not, we're not doing that, bro. You know, what do you do if you're playing poker with somebody, okay, and you're going for the river and you didn't hit, you know, fly, you know whatever, uh, uh, pick something. You didn't hit your three of a kind, okay? You missed the river, but you got two pair. It's a jack. You got a jack, you got a jack on the board. All of a sudden, you're about to bluff the guy, maybe go in 50% of what the chip is, you know, there. But one card accidentally falls on the ground and you see it. It's an ace, and there's an ace on the. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? You already know you lost. So guess what? The establishment revealed their cards, and we saw it. And if we don't realize it and do something with it, and they still move their agenda, it was our fault all along. But if we saw it, and we unify, and we come together saying, hey, guys, we the people have the power. They ain't going to push us around. We love this country. Let's fight for what makes this country great. Let's go and support what this country was great about. Let's bring it back to that. Let's be a little bit more responsible. Let's have better incentive programs. Let's expect better policies from them. Let's hold them accountable to what they say they're going to do. Now we can go in the better direction. And we encourage certain people to run and get involved in politics and office. So I don't think it's going to happen because I think on one end, capitalists, the rich people are not going to want to lose all their, all their money. So they're eventually going to be like, yeah, I don't support what you're doing, Soros. Yeah, I don't support what you're doing. Yeah, Charlie Munger said something very interesting. He says, look, I love Larry Fink, but I don't want him as my emperor. What a thing to say. Munger, here's a guy that's 94 years old. I don't know how old he is, but mid-90s. Mm -hmm. He's saying, hey, I respect Larry Fink, but I don't want him as an emperor. Because they know what Larry Fink's trying to do. People are not dummies, right? So those types of people, I think, are going to fight each other enough. And if we keep our eyes open, this will continue to be the greatest country in the world and hopefully even better if we rise up to it. If not, the best days are behind us. If we don't learn our lesson from the last three years. It's interesting. I have a slightly different take if I put my I'm paranoid hat on. Uh, so I think that at some point, we started attacking the very idea of structure itself, which is how you end up getting into the gender conversation. And once you start, if it takes hold, and it's a very difficult argument to figure out how to be both compassionate and draw hard boundaries, you put lines and boundaries. And one thing we didn't talk about is you create rituals that create lines that I'm no longer a child. I'm now an adult, like really clear demarcation points instead of like, oh, transition effortlessly anytime from anything to anything. It's one of those ideas that sounds awesome and it sounds loving and it sounds caring, but the outcome of it is, is to tear at the um, infrastructure that holds the society up. And so it was pretty interesting. This is something that um, Douglas Murray, who I have not ever sat down with, but I'm very familiar with his work. He's talked a lot about, Camille LaPaglia uh, has talked a lot about this, that in end stage empires, they become obsessed with pulling apart the um, structures of the society. And it tends to manifest as a conversation around the ultimate structure, which is male, female. So this is one of those, it's a, a positive feedback loop. And again, I'm, I'm just wearing my paranoid hat. I'm, I'm not betting against America. I love it. I want to be here. Um, in fact, I, I, this is going to be weird. I can't believe I'm about to say something that's going to sound political. It is not meant to be political, but I want to fly an American flag. I want to remind people that this is a beautiful country and that it's worth fighting for ideals of personal freedom, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that the way that we rebuild is by putting structure in place that has a metric associated with it so we can see whether we're moving in the right direction or not. That would be the, the thing. So anyway, it, this feels like a positive feedback loop. I don't have a clear picture on how at a societal level we unwind it, but I do understand it at the individual level and the things that we as an individual person can do uh, to make sure that we are doing something that will be You're beneficial. very sweet. You're very sweet. And here's what I mean by it. Um, I am so confused when I hear a guy who created thousands of jobs, 
created a billion dollar of value for people who owned equity that you're worried about saying, I don't want to be political about the American flag because it may offend somebody. No, I didn't say that. I know that. But what I'm saying to you is even the fact that you gave that qualification to me is um, is where I, uh, I don't think we need to be there. Here's what I mean by that. I'm, I'm talking at this Christian school that my kids go to. And uh, the dean, what is what is above a dean? Whatever the uh, what do they call the person that runs the school? What, the, the, what's I thought the, it was dean. No, there's one other guy. There's something about it that, uh, whatever it is, the dean reports to this guy. Do you guys know what that's called? Or no, not principal. It's a different name they have for him. Headmaster? Mm. Is it headmaster? Sure. Okay. So headmaster, and uh, he gets up there and he's giving this talk to 600 kids and he's bringing me up Veterans Day. He's like, well, you know, America's not perfect and we have this and we have flaws and all this. To, like peak of COVID, like a year and a half ago. I'm standing there, I'm like, dude, like, where have you lived? You know, have you lived in Iran? Have you lived in other places? Like, what, what they think about this place? And I get up and I, and I say, first of all, thank you for this, and blah, 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 blah. And I said, America's the greatest country in the world, okay? And, you know, we don't care if you're a Christian. I don't know what your faith is. We're getting along. I'm Middle Eastern, bro, you're white. Every time we're together, we get along. Best conversations when I'm talking to you. Fantastic conversation. I got so much respect for you to build what you build. Your wife came in, sweetheart, gave me a hug, warm, welcome, your peers, your people here, how you're working, how you're moving, what you're doing, having a blast, creating great content, great conversations. But I do think we need to, we need to have some um, pride in how great of a country we live in. I think we need to sell it. I had Governor DeSantis on the podcast two days ago. We did an hour live podcast. He flew into the office and it was a great conversation. He's one of the candidates that's uh, you know, potentially presidential candidate. And I said, can you sell America, please? Sell America. And you know, he tr did his best to sell America in his point of view. But I think we need to do a better job selling America, saying, selling the ideas of America. Here's what happened in the last couple of years. I'm having this conversation. I don't know if I'm having this conversation with Rogan or whoever I'm having a conversation. Maybe it was on the Rogan. Yeah, it's on the Rogan podcast we're talking on communities that hurt America, okay? I said one is the tolerant Christians mm. who hurt America. They're like, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. You're either a Christian or you're not. You can say whatever you want about Muslims. But what guess, guess what Muslims are? They believe their religion. Okay, and you're not going to be able to say things about their prophet. You can't. Go say something about Prophet Muhammad. See what happens. Go say something about Jesus. See what happens. Yeah, it's okay. He's just upset, you know. Okay, cool. All right. The other one is libertarians, because libertarians who are like, do your thing, bro. As long as you do your thing, I'm good. Do your thing. 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 All right. Now they're doing their thing with your kids. Now what do you want to do? It's too late. It's in your school. Well, no, 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 I didn't say that. Well, I'm sorry, you said libertarian to each his own. Well, no, 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 that doesn't mean you come and do this to my kids. No, it's called, as long as you do your thing, I'm good. The do your thing, they came back and haunted you through your kids. No, I'm not cool with that. Well, then maybe, maybe you're not really a libertarian. Maybe there's a different element to your politics that you got to really reconsider. The, the, the wealthy, you know, conservatives who raise good kids, who all of a sudden have all this money, but they're afraid. God forbid it leaks that they have an element of conservative. Oh my God, I may lose my audience. I may lose this. I may lose that. And they're like, okay, we won't be invited to those parties. And they're not going to like us. And what Today I'm having a conversation with Chris Cuomo. Cuomo and I have turned into very good friends. We don't agree together politically. We have a great conversation together. I'm at his house in, in uh, Sag Harbor. And we have lunch and we go to his place. And all of a sudden he surprised me with a call with Robert Downey Jr. Hey, what's up, PVD? I was up, Robert down and I say, hey kids, come see what this is. Oh my God. It's imagine a reaction of kids who watch Iron Man die and they're like crying, saying, He's alive. He's alive. He's alive right here in the flesh. But we're having these conversations. I'm sitting thinking to myself, did these guys know my political positions that I take? And we're getting along. It's okay. It's not the end of the world. This is what I believe in. You know, but these Republicans that conservatives that took their money and they're like, Look, as long as we protect our money, just buy real estate, have some assets, but don't do anything with all this money we have. No problem. The other guys went and bought New York Times. The other guys went and bought WAPO. 
Time magazine. China owned Forbes. 95% of Forbes was owned by China. And 2021 International Woman of the Year is who? Hillary Clinton. What? She doesn't run a business. How about Oprah Winfrey? How about Sheryl Sandberg? You give it to Hillary? What, what did she do in business? Forbes is all business. The guy who ran Forbes, the son, the guy who started it was his father, but the guy that ran it, that took it to the next level, he had a jet. Google this. It says Capitalist Tool. His jet on the corner, the name of the plane was Capitalist Tool. His yacht, it would said Capitalist Tool. The helicopter said Capitalist Tool. These are the tools a capitalist used. He had all biggest collection of those eggs. You know the Russian eggs? There's a name for those Russian mm, eggs. Fabergé. Fabergé. That was estimated to be half a billion dollars. Whoa. This, he, had, he had 15 of them. His best friend was Elizabeth Taylor. Best friend for his 70th birthday party, if you've never seen this guy's documentary. His 70th birthday party. Everybody's there. You know what he gives to everybody on his birthday party? A Rolex. Who does that? This guy's a capitalist at the core. And guess what we admired back then? Wow. Life of the rich and famous. Today is life of the poor and the miserables. No, we're admiring things that people are growing up to want to pursue. No, we got to edify the guys that busted their tails to build a company. We got to edify the people that are creating economy. We got to edify people that are going out there being good, net positive to society. We need more Tom Billions in America. But those three communities, and I can keep going with a couple other communities, but I'll stick to those three communities. I think they have, they have, they have, uh, 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 they have given others a lot of uh, uh, power. As a, as, a, as a guy who was an atheist for 25 years of my life in the Army, I've told this story before, in the Army I was invited to go to this uh, 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 camp with this man, 70-year-old man, and you know we were able to jump into this lake and play pool and all this stuff. But every night for one hour, he had to sit down with him and listen to him read the Bible. And I would sit in the back, I'm like, dude, you can tell me about Bible all you want. Why don't you go back to Iran and see what I saw when we got bombed? Now go ahead. Go see what I saw. Go see the parks I used to go to and these buildings that were torn down. When I see what's going on right now in Palestine, Israel, I live this. I, the whole alarm. Tabajo, Tabajo. Alamate Kermes. Attention, attention. Red signal means that planes have crossed the border. The enemy is here. You know what that does when I listen to this? I'll, I'll go to YouTube sometimes and listen to it to see how quickly I can go to the eight year old kid mm. and see it. The other day, my sister sends me a picture, says, hey, this is me and you at eight years old. Do you remember this? I said, okay, what's the big deal with this picture? We got a lot of pictures like this. She says, you know how you always talk about the windows dad used to tape? Look at the windows. I see the windows. It's the tapes from my dad. They put the tapes because when bombs would explode, they didn't want the glass to explode all over us. They wanted to stick together. That's mm -hmm. what we did in Iran. And, you know, so today, when you see this whole concept of you know, I'm at this camp in the military. You know, he gives me a Bible. He says, "This my parents gave me this Bible December 24th of 1974. And son, I think you need this more than me. I said, sir, I promise you're giving it to the wrong guy. He says, just please take it from me. You need this. I said, I don't need this. Keep it. It's a gift your parents gave you. He, I have the Bible till today. He gives it to me. I don't read the Bible. It sits at my barracks in the army. But I started praying three times a week, three times a day, every day. And here's how my prayer was. God, I don't believe you exist. I think it's for weak people. But if you do exist... Cool. Let's see what you got. If you don't, it's going to feel good talking to myself anyways because I know nobody in boot camp. Now, from Iran, there's not a lot of Iranians in boot camp. So eventually, that idea of having faith is what Hitler feared. He did not want people to have faith. The whole Dietrich Bonhoeffer story, if you read what he did, he didn't want people to have faith. He wanted to eliminate having faith. Does that remind you of anything? We can't pray anymore. We can't do the Pledge of Allegiance when kids go to school. Oh, but we should learn about LGBTQ stuff. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Let's take out faith and uh, let's replace it with somebody may be gay. You may be gay. Your mommy and daddy don't know. So guess what happens? Parents in Florida are saying, we don't feel comfortable because our kids want to transition and Governor DeSantis doesn't allow, so we're moving to California. They're coming to your state. And people have started making decisions saying it's okay if they take these pills under 18 years old. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? So an under under 18 years old, I can't own a gun. I can't join the army. I can't under 16, I can't own a car. I can't have a driver's license. I can't drink alcohol, but I can change my sex. You tell me somebody who has common sense, sell that to me. Over 18, go do it. Totally get it. Under 18, in what logical manual of a group of 100 people that can reason they could say, this makes sense. There is no none of that. It's gaslighting. So we have to sit there and listen to it and say, 
And by the way, I know this is off brand for you. This is not the kind of conversations you have on. on you know, I don't want you to get uncomfortable, but I am completely for, comfortable. For me, I think we need to go back to square one. We need to go sit there and like I was having this conversation with a group of people who are not Christians, and I said, "You got five countries to live in. Where do you want your kids to be raised? A country that's atheist, they don't believe in anything. A country that's Catholic, a country that's Muslim, a country that's this, a country that's a, country, a country that's Christian. Where do you want to raise your kids? Where do you want to raise your kids? They're like, well, probably more country that's this. Okay, why? Why? Because the values and principles are X, Y, Z. Great, no problem. Even we had a the debate the other day. I had two Muslims and I had two Christians on a podcast and they're debating each other. And the guy's talking about all these things. And then I said, listen, I, I, I have a lot of Muslim friends. I have great conversations. Why don't people immigrate to Muslim countries? Why do Muslims come to America? I don't know. Why do we in America have all these different denominations all over the place? Nobody cares. Why don't they move into these other places? Oh, it's purely economical. Okay. Why aren't we moving into many of these other places that economically they have a lot of oil? Why are we not doing that? Well, it's this, this, that. Totally get it. By the way, to the Christians who get upset and are like, well, you know, but you don't understand what Muslims are doing and they're going to do this and eventually they're going to run America. Of course they are. How could you say that? They're having 2.9 kids per woman and the rest are not, not even close. So mathematically, yes, we're eventually going to have a Muslim president if we haven't already had one eight years ago. We're going to have Congress being controlled by them and that's also Senate. On the competitive side, instead of being upset about it, why don't you start having more kids? We're not having enough kids. So the people that should be having more kids are not having enough kids, and the people that shouldn't be having kids are having way too many kids. This is also a problem that we're not talking about. So to me, we have a lot of issues. Some we can address the next three to five years, some that we can fix and make progress on the next 10 years. Some of it's going to be 20, and then some of it is what Ray Dalio talks about. And he's talking investments, but I'm talking a cycle of 50 years that it's going to take us. But these are the types of things that we should have open dialogue about. We should be comfortable selling uh, America. We got 53 million immigrants in America, more than any other country in the world, and it's not even close. There's a reason for it. We can ask the question why. Maybe we offer the best thing in the world. And we need to protect of that. And people who come here, it shouldn't be. I'm having this conversation with one guy on my podcast. I said, if an immigrant comes to America... Who owes who? Does America owe immigrants something? Or is the immigrant the owes uh, the, the country something? Oh, America owes the immigrant. America doesn't owe immigrant nothing. Nothing. The person coming here owes America everything because they let you in. That's who owes the other person. Well, no, I, you're, you're, how could you think like that? You're thinking like what they did 100 years ago. No, no, it's called logic. It's called logic. You're allowing me to come into your homeland and you owe me? Dude, you don't owe me. I owe you. Thank you. So how do you show gratitude? How are you going to show gratitude? So you're an immigrant now in America. How are you going to make America a better place? Like, like what we had before when you would go to, you know, uh, um, what's that island that you would go to and you would show what talents you're bringing and then we'll let you into America. Ellis Island. Ellis Island, right? Okay, so uh, what do you bring to the table? You know, nothing. I'm just excited about the benefits you guys offer. But what do you bring to the table? We need to kind of present this argument. How, why should you earn the right to come to America? And what can we do to get the best immigrants coming here? Mm. What can we do to get the most educated people coming here who are from IIT graduate people? What can we get the people that are best in math, that are bringing something here? These are very basic common sense conversations that the last three years people from academia and universities have confused the hell out of kids. Where kids coming out of college today are questioning common sense. I had a guy that's one of my C-suite executives. Every time I would talk to him, I would say, how's your daughter doing? How's your daughter doing? How's your daughter doing? He says, breaks my heart. I said, tell me why. My daughter and I were like this. I spent $200,000 sending her to this XYZ school in Illinois. Every year, my daughter hated me more. By the fourth year, she didn't even want to come back to the house. She moved to L.A. Wow. I said, you got to be kidding me. He says, Pat, I spent $200,000 to lose my daughter? Now, here's the thing. Odds are my daughter's probably going to come back, but she may come back at 32. I could lose 10 years of my daughter's life at this age? At this age? 
I will look at his face. This is a performer. This is a rock star. He's a leader. He's, a multi, he's had multiple exits. He's a leader, successful guy. But you could see the anguish on his face. Dude, that's not cool. That's not cool. So you want me to send my kids to you and you pin them against me and I'm the one that paid the money to go to your college? That's not okay. While you're sitting on $60 billion of money in your endowment that you can afford to pay every single student's college tuition for the next 100 years, yet you want us to pay you $60,000 per year and I stay home instead of go to your college? Yeah, you, you showed us who you are, and I, I am not going to forget it. I'm going to impose, and I'm going to keep talking about this stuff. And enough people are going to sit there and say, that was an interesting conversation. You know, maybe we need to think about that, babe. Did you hear what he just said? Did you hear what she just said? And then collectively, two, three, four, five, ten years down the line, like I used to not be awakened to see what's really taking place because my head's down building a business. I don't care about politics. Mm. I'm just simply trying to build a business. And then all of a sudden you're like, nah, man, I got four kids, an 11, 10, and a seven-year-old, and a two-year-old. We gotta kind of be involved. I know I went off tangent, but when you made that comment about, I don't want to be political America, I think you're the prime example of what makes America great, and we need more people like you. Are men today weak? And if so, what can we do about it? If you look at data, yes. From 1960 till today, our population has increased around 90%. But in 1960, 7 million people used to live by themselves. Today's 38 million. Whoa. 442% increase, right? So what happens when we're alone? You don't have competition kicking your ass, challenging you, pushing you, having all that stuff taking place. Standards today are slightly uh, lower. Uh, you can look at strength with men, with boys, what they have going on. Uh, then there's another data that's deeply concerning. When you look at from 1940, the percentage of kids that were born to a single mother in 1940 was 4%. 1940, 4%. That means 96% of kids that were born in 1940 were born in a household of a mom and a dad. And today, we went from 4% in 1940 to 40% today. Whoa. That's 10x, a data we do not want to be bragging about. By the way, worldwide, we're the worst when you look at data. China, India, they keep it together. We don't keep it together. Middle Easterns, they keep it together. Muslims keep it together. But in America, we've gone a completely different way. Now, some people will say this was FDR's bad policies because the whole welfare state. Some will say this was Lyndon Johnson. But regardless who we choose to blame and put the responsibility on, here's what we will look at. A father offers two things that naturally comes to him when it comes on to boys. So you, when we're talking, choose your enemies wisely, I'm talking to Tom Brady and I said, Tom, when I look at somebody that does something very big, they have three things in common. One, they experienced unconditional love. So somebody that no matter what you did, you got arrested, oh my God, babe, are you okay? What happened in jail? Did they do anything to you? Like, you can't do nothing wrong in this person's eye. Like, you actually understand, I cannot believe this human being loves me, and I can go to jail, you still love me. Freaking awesome, right? We need that. The second thing we need is an unbelievable amount of pain from someone you loved. Meaning, no matter what you and I do, we can never make this person happy. You can win Mr. Olympia, you can become a billionaire, you can become a president, you can become whatever you want to become. This, to this person's eye, it's always going to be like, yeah, whatever, but, yeah, whatever. So you're never going to win this person. And your entire life, you're pursuing converting this person and baptizing them into finally celebrating your success, right? And the last thing was, you choose your enemies wisely. Brady chose his enemies wisely. Dana White chose his enemies wisely. You got a lot of these guys that you look at. So where am I going with this? You come back to the boys you're asking about. Young boys not having a father, father gives one of three elements that you need. As a, as a kid growing up, you have to be loved, but you need somebody you fear and you need somebody you respect. If a boy is raised, most boys you get to an age, I remember one time I'm 14 years old, my mom is hitting me and I'm like, what are you doing? Your hand hurts. What are you doing? It's the last time she hit me because it, it hurt her when she's hitting me. I'm 14 years old. It's doing nothing to me. That was the last time. I said, you can hit me all you want. It's not going to do anything to me. So what happened in that moment? I no longer feared her. I no longer saw her from an authority place. I just saw her from a place that I love her. Not fear, 
not respect like you're going to make me do something. You can't make me do anything. I'm coming home at 10 o'clock. My parents were divorced. I'm coming home whatever time I come home. Where were you? Not your business. I'm home, mm. right? That, that kind of respect that a kid will have. But a father, if you have fear, respect, and love, that boy has the highest likelihood of doing something big with his life. Our current incentive program in America, our current tax system in America, doesn't reward husband and wives having kids together. That decreases the chances of a boy being raised by a father. What does it do? Produces reckless criminals, produces kids that don't have order, produces kids that think they can do whatever they want to do, and essentially they become net negative to society. So you asked me the question, I would say yes, but it's a multidimensional answer. Yeah, so when I think about what it takes to form a strong man in a time where the thought of power itself is considered negative, so this would be now 23, 24 years ago, I created a domain called Seeking Power. And I remember telling people about it in the beginning and there was just sort of an intuitive, oh yeah, I get it, that's cool. But somewhere over time that became like, oh, power, like that's such a gross thing. It's almost disgusting to want power. I was caught so off guard by that because I had my head down, I was building something and I was building things in a way that absolutely required aggression and power. And when I look at people that want to do something big in their lives, mm -hmm that aren't able to generate power, they're not able to tap into aggression. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you're not gonna be able to do the things you wanna do. You're gonna have a sense of internal weakness, um, a sense of frustration, not knowing how to make the things come true in your life that you want to. And then if you layer on top of that a victim mentality and somebody tells you, no, 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 the problem is that somebody's holding you back or whatever, you suddenly have a story for why you feel the way you feel, but it's not the true story. And so to me, that creates this like death spiral of for, forget, like I'm not doing it as like a keep off my lawn thing, but I'm really mortified by what is being pushed as like, this is what we should aspire to. And reading your book was really interesting because your book isn't about how to make strong men, but the tactics of getting successful at building a business, and obviously it's more nuanced than just building a business, but it is an mm -hmm. easy way to talk mm -hmm. about it. Um, you basically spend 300 pages talking about how to cultivate capture and use aggression. So walk me through, what, what is the trick that people are missing? One, do they need to uh, understand power, revere power? What is power? You ever read the book, Power Versus Force? I'm, I'm certain you've read the book. Actually. Okay, Power Versus Force. A guy like you, good luck putting it down. It's, it's, it's written for a guy like you. So the author, David Schwartz, talks about different levels we go to where we calibrate. At the bottom, whatever these eight levels are, you're trying to force life. And then the next levels, you actually start gaining power. You start becoming powerful, right? So at the bottom, the lowest level of calibration he talks about is shame, then it's guilt, apathy, fear, anger, pride, desire, like I desire drugs, alcohol, stuff mm -hmm. like that. First level of consciousness that you start gaining power and control of your life is courage. You have the courage to be wrong. You have the courage to fail. You have the courage to talk to people you disagree with, courage. Then it goes willingness. Then it goes acceptance. Then it goes neutrality. Like I can stay neutral. Like you have a very high score. If you look at the book, your score is gonna be high because you have courage you're willing, you're able to stay neutral and process both sides of the story, acceptance, then it goes love, joy, peace, enlightenment. And enlightenment, there's only been two or three they put at that level. This is when you're talking about Jesus, people like that. In regards to the aggression you're talking about or the, the power, why should somebody have, you know, fight for the power or how to go about getting the power, it, it, it all comes back down to what level of a life you want to live, okay? I'm having a conversation with this guy, and I said, do you believe in God? He says, no, I don't believe in God. I said, okay, so what is God? Everybody has a God. It doesn't matter who you are. You got a God. No, I don't. Yeah, you do. No, I don't. I don't, I don't have a God. Oh, really? No. Why are you building a YouTube channel with 4 million subscribers? This is the guy I'm talking to. You know who he is, right? Why are you building something like this? What? What are you trying to get? What are you seeking? Maybe your God is data. For some people, God is 
sex, for some people God is porn, for some people God is drugs or attention or whatever it may be, right? Power is a similar way as well. You know, years ago, Phil Donahue was interviewing uh, Milton Friedman. Mm. This is, we're talking 50 years ago. This is in the 70s, 74, 78. He's wearing a yellow, if you put it, I think it's like 43 minutes. And Phil Donahue, who at the time was a socialist, you know, he kind of came from that side. He says, so why do you think, you know, what do you think is the problem with all these greedy people in America? And Milton Friedman smiles and he says, it's always the other fellow that's greedy, right? You're not greedy at all, he's saying to him. Mm. He said, oh, we're definitely not greedy here. It's always the other person, right? Everybody's greedy. Everybody's selfish. Everybody wants power. Everybody, you know, wants to get a certain level of attention. Everybody wants to win. Everybody wants affirmation to be affirmed and say, you know what? You're a leader. You're a CEO. You're a rock star. You're this. We want that. That is a form of us being almost proud of ourselves that our existence was worth it. Everyone's going through this journey. How you go about it is trying to question everything. You know, I remember this whole concept of selfish. Now, that guy is selfish. That guy is selfish. And then you'd say, I'm not selfish, and you would fight it. You know what? You got lucky. I didn't get lucky. You don't know how hard I work to be this. And then eventually I'm like, I'll dance with you. You got lucky. I agree. You're selfish. Yeah. You don't have anything to say because everybody is selfish. Everybody wants to be lucky. I don't mind being lucky, but here's what happened. In the book, there's a section where we talk about the selfish, selfless score, right? What percentage of you is selfish and what percentage of you is selfless? So we had a, a focus group that we did and we're asking a group. We said, uh, what is a person who is 100% selfless, 0% selfish look like? And what is a person who is 100% selfish, 0% look like? Then, who is actually more of a net positive to society? You know what conclusion we came with? The person that's selfless probably smells, doesn't take care of themselves, they don't care about themselves, they don't wear nice clothes, they don't eat good food, they don't take care of themselves, everything's about other people, it's in a state of conformity, and the other person that's selfish 100% probably doesn't make a good friend, probably doesn't make a good spouse, but they probably look good, they probably smell good, they probably make good money, they probably eat good food, they probably find a way to win. Do you want that person as your CEO? No. Do you want that person as your husband or your wife? No. Do you want that person as your president? Absolutely no. But guess what? Individually, just for the sake of selfishly not embarrassing themselves, they're going to do things because it's all about them. So then we broke it down and we said, what level of calibration is good to be a CEO of a company? Okay, do, do you need a 30-70, 30% selfish, 70% selfless? Well, no, that's bad, why? Because we need you to have big dreams. We need you to be pursuing something. We need you to be after something. If you're not pursuing something, why are you coming to work early? Why are you spending a weekend thinking about ideas? You're not gonna be thinking about that. Somebody's driving by the freeway, the average person like, oh, nice thing right there. You're gonna be like, babe, can you pull over? Let me go in there. Oh, I just got an idea. Think about it. Look at it from this angle. What if we did this to the company? And what if we brought this product? Let's walk inside and see what this building looks like. Because you're constantly thinking about getting closer to the vision that you have. So we learned the profile of somebody that is at the right scoring to be a leader is 70-30. 70% selfish desires you're going after. Vision. Who you want to be. The life you want to build. Then 30% is selfless. That person makes for a good father. That person makes for a good husband. That person makes for a good leader. That person inspires others to go. That person challenges others. That person's not going to get too content, too comfortable. So as we're talking about aggression or power or, or any of that stuff, you know, somebody may be listening to this and they're going to say, man, you are not my cup of tea. Totally get it. I'm not for everybody. But the right person watching this, they're going to be like, that makes a lot of sense. I've never seen selfishness explained that way before. That makes a lot of sense. I've never heard Milton Friedman explaining greed that way before. That makes a lot of sense about power. Okay, let me find a way for me to become a net positive to society. And then you kind of go through that process. But we got a lot of words that we have a hard time with because somebody told us it's a bad word. You know, be powerful, have power, be selfish, you know, greed. No, no, no. I don't ever want to have any of those and I don't want to be lucky. When you break it down and you actually look at it, 
people who ended up winning at the highest level, they got lucky, they seek power, they had selfish desires, they were greedy, ended up having a life that they had, and they were more of a positive to society than people who didn't have those four things. They also inspire people. There's, to me, I think what all this ultimately boils down to is nobody, and I mean nobody, wants to feel out of control. And once you understand that to gain control of your life, you must have at least power by my definition. So my quick way of defining power is close your eyes, imagine a world better than this one, open your eyes, and go gain the skill set necessary to actually make that world come true. And so it's really a battle to get better at something that matters to you and serves yourself for sure, but also other people. And if you live in that pursuit, you will very quickly realize that you are up against the world's tendency to move towards chaos. Now, people hate it when I frame it in that this is just the second law of thermodynamics. The world moves towards chaos. That just is true. It's entropy. But I guess because it has a weird word attached to it, people don't really stop to think about it. But if you're trying to be an entrepreneur, I will tell you there are two enemies that you're going to face, your own mind and entropy. And entropy as represented by uh, your wife falls ill at the worst possible time when you have a major presentation. Um, you have a competitor that's trying to take you out. You get sued by somebody uh, in a moment of fragility, whatever. Like. There is going to be a litany of problems. Yeah. Every day is like getting kicked in the face. And in those moments, the only way to persevere is with a level of ferocity. Like you have to be able to push through those storms to inject enough energy into the system that you can bring order to an otherwise chaotic system and move it in the exact direction that you want it to go. But to do that, you really have to be able to Get aggressive. That's the the kindest word I will give to it. You're very unabashed about talking about, I'm using my own words, but talking about aggression in your book, what I call the dark energy. Um, one, do you agree that the reason that you, the reason that I would want men, anybody listening to this, any man certainly out there, anybody that's training you to, um, you should have a gear that is soft. You should be able to be gentle. I'm not trying to create um, people that, that only have one gear, but one of your gears should be aggression, focus, determination, the ability to run through a wall to ensure that something gets done that will not happen by accident. You are absolutely going to have to make that a value, turn that value into a set of skills, courage being one of them, and then pushing yourself forward in a very specific way towards a very specific aim. Do you agree with that need or... Am I, yeah, missing I love the way you put it. I love the way you put it. So the key word here we use is business planning for the audacious mm. few, right? Audacious few, audacious few. It's not for everybody. It's the audacious few. For example, when you break down who you want to be in life, okay, I don't know if you're a sports guy or not. You watch a sports team. There's a guy that's just a supporting cast. Mm. That's what he does. That's the role he's going to play. There's a guy that is coming off the bench and he does what he does. Then there's a guy that's the flag carrier to the best guy. Okay, each team's got a flag carrier. In a lot of places, there was this player named Paul George. He runs a podcast with uh, one of my good friend, Dudley Rutherford's son, Dallas. They do a very good job together, and they interview other uh, uh, basketball players. And he said something so powerful in one of the podcasts. He says, look, it took me years to realize I can't win a championship as a number one. Mm. He says, I've been the best player on a team. I can't win a championship as a number one. I can win a championship as a two and a three, but I can't win as a one. Guess what? He realized he has to be a flag carrier. He's not a one. This week I had Ron DeSantis on the podcast, I Governor Ron DeSantis, it. right? Should you watch the whole thing? Because it's a pretty uh, uh, fiery podcast that get to uh, the end. caused the- uh, You have so much content yeah, now yeah. that- uh, Well, and ended up causing the number two uh, trending hashtag for two days. Did you guys end up arguing? Because the part I saw, you guys were very cordial. We, we didn't end up arguing, but I asked him a couple tough questions about marketing, his boots, and all mm. this other stuff, and a video of him, Trump. Anyways, it was, it was a bunch of different things we talked about. But when I'm talking to uh, DeSantis, I asked him the following question. I said, I think there's two different types of presidents. And he says, what type? I said, one is alphas. Yep. Lincoln is the alpha. Ulysses S. Grant is the flag carrier. He became a two-term president. Mm. Not a great president, but he was not an alpha. Okay, He needed Lincoln to be the flag carrier too. Ike, alpha. Nixon, he was a flag carrier. John F. Kennedy, alpha. LBJ took him out. He became president, allegedly. 
<laughs> you got Reagan Alpha, okay, senior, is a flag carrier. You got Obama Alpha, Bill Clinton Alpha. Those two are alphas. Trump Alpha, George Bush the son, flag carrier, father, lineage, Prescott. Then you have Biden today. He's a flag carrier. He His uh, way of becoming a president was, Obama, you're the greatest, you're the best, you're this, you're that. Boom. This is your opportunity for being loyal to me. Mm. Now I will come work for you. You become the president, right? I asked Governor DeSantis, do you think you're the alpha or a flag carrier? Okay. Now his answer could be whatever he thinks it is, but the market's going to determine whether he's an alpha mm. or he's a flag carrier. What so, do you think? He said alpha. Well, he he said technically alpha. he said I'm he, a leader. And, and by the way, you may be an alpha in a room of 50. Mm -hmm. You may be an alpha in a company of 1,000. You may be the alpha in a company of 100,000. You may be the alpha in a state of 30 million, but you may not be the alpha in a country of 340 million. Alphas have levels, and it depends what level of an alpha you can be. And that's very tough to swallow for everybody. It's not for everybody. And why is that? Here's why you said something very interesting. You used a couple words and you said, you know, two reasons, business, all this stuff. You know, your wife gets sick and you're going to an appointment. What do you do with that? No, there is no manual that says, hey, when your wife gets cancer, 19 steps on what to do next. There is no such thing as that. Your, your son just went through this. Here's the eight steps. When, there is no manual for that in life. And by the way, the people who went through those situations like a, I recommended this book recently. I read the book 2008 when it first came out uh, by the coach of Indi Indianapolis Colts. Uh, the book is called Quiet Strength, Tony Dungy, okay? I don't know if you know the story or not. Mm. He's coaching. The weekend of Super Bowl, he's about to win his first Super Bowl ever, okay? His son dies at 23 oh, years old. Oh, Jesus. His son dies at 23, 24 years old. There isn't a single person in the world that's expecting this guy to be there on Sunday mm. to coach. If he didn't, what would you and I say? We totally wouldn't judge him. We're no like, way. dude, what are you talking about? Totally get it. This guy chooses to show up to the game with a smile on his face. He says, because I believe he's in a better place. He's with God right now. I'm at peace. They win the game. I got the chills all over my body. He writes this book, Quiet Strength. Incredible book. I remember I heard this guy speak, gave a talk when he came out. And go explain that to somebody and say, hey, you should go coach. You, nobody has the permission to tell anybody to go coach. That's the individual's level of handling chaos, pressure, pain, and everyone's different in that. There's not a manual for that. However, where, I, where I'm going with this on the alpha side is if you want to be the guy of the guys of other guys, you, you can't go by the standard as everybody else does. For example, um, World War II is taking place, okay? Chamberlain is doing what he's doing, UK. The most hated guy in that country is a journalist who talks shit about everybody, okay? Who Chamberlain hates, disgusted by him. Very arrogant, very cocky, pompous sometimes. If Twitter was around when Churchill was around, he'd be on Twitter all the time, that kind of a guy. He had an opinion about everybody, and he was only 5'6". You know what Chamberlain has to do? He has to beg Churchill to show up. Churchill shows up. The only man that was able to face the most feared man in the world was Churchill. Churchill may be the reason why we're doing this interview in English and not in German today. Yeah. Think about the power of that. However, just the chills. this guy, Churchill, that we're talking about was hated, but he was a wartime leader. When war took place, everybody had to call the person they hate the most because they, they knew they were not cut for that job. It's not for them. So there's the levels of alpha. There's the levels of success you want in life. There's a reason why Jordan said, you know, if you don't want to play, you know, but I'm going to win. And the last dance, and he starts crying. You know, you're like, dude, I can see this guy's fire. That's why there's only one mic. Mm. That's why we were all glued to the screen for five weeks on Sundays watching two episodes from 8 to 10 o'clock. And we were all blown away by how this guy was a wired. But who got pissed off afterwards? Scotty Pippen. And then Scotty writes a book. And in the interview, he's being asked, Scotty, how do you want to be remembered? And he's got a smirk on his face. He says, I want to be remembered as the greatest of all time. Dude, you're not the greatest of all time. You're top 50. See, he forgot he was a flag carrier, and he wanted the respect of this guy. To have the respect of this guy, 
is not duplicatable. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of effort. So for somebody watching this, again, choose your enemies wisely, but it's business planning for the audacious few, not the timid majority. It's not for everybody. This is for the audacious few. If you feel you're part of the audacious few, this book's for you. If not, it's not for everybody. This is admittedly meant to be inflammatory, but I care so much about the answer to this that I like the inflammatory nature of the following question. What should a real man be like? I believe there are a set of things that I am perfectly comfortable laying out saying, this is what I think. What should a real man be like? What are the qualifications? What should a real man be like? Um, you know, uh, uh, for me, I had a, a man, Monty, he would say something. He would say, you know, uh, your house, every 90 days, you should, you know, they should feel the fire, but not enough to burn a house down. But every 90 days, your kids should see what you're capable of. Okay, where they're like, ooh, I just saw that side of dad. Okay, and his reference was with your people you're working with, with your salespeople. Now, today, God forbid you say this on Huff Po, they're gonna say you have mental issues, okay? Yeah. You need to go to therapy, you need to go hire Jack Nicholson to go through a real life of anger management, and you're Adam Sandler, and you know, you have issues, you have, you have anger issues. But there, there needs to be a certain level of fear and respect where a man imposes, but you don't have to use. You know, the reason why they call it a great equalizer, the gun, is because you knew I had it, but that doesn't mean I use it. What's the whole purpose of jujitsu or martial arts? Is for the other person to know, look, bro, you just don't want to fight. That's all there is to it. I have no desire to fight you, but if we do fight, it's going to be very bad. There's this video on, on uh, uh, TikTok and Instagram that went viral, and this father is outside. This guy's punking his daughter every time he walks by. He says, bro, what's wrong with you? What's the matter with you? And the guy's swinging. He says, don't do this. I don't want to do this to you. He starts swinging. He says, I'm telling you. I'm telling you again. Don't do this. I'm going to hurt you. The last time he does, the dad picks him up, drops him to the ground, drops him, grabs his hands, doesn't punch him one time. He said, how many times did I tell you don't do this? I know what I'm doing. Cops come, take him and go away, right? The marketplace should know what you're capable of. Now, to get to that point takes a while. When you're a kid, when I talk to my kids and we talk about the values and principles we have where we lead, respect, and prove love, we don't get bullied and we don't bully. That's our principles that we have. Um, my son knows the market today for him is the school he goes to. The school just needs to know what you're capable of one time. Marketing's gonna do its part. Everyone's gonna talk to each other. You don't need to do it 50 times. You don't need to do it 100 times. You need to do it one time. Once they know, the other people are like, you know what? Not the biggest guy, but I just don't want to mess with that guy because he's annoying. He's going to keep fighting you. Leave that guy alone. Let me pick on this guy, right? And then that guy's job is to do the same thing. So from that perspective, um, I think it's good to have a reputation in the marketplace. Uh, I think it's good to have a reputation within your family where your spouse feels protected by you. When we got married at our wedding, at the end of the wedding, uh, everybody's hammered, everybody's drunk, and I got up to give a speech. I said, I got a couple things I want to talk to you guys about. There's 500 people at the wedding. I said, one, uh, I don't know how long we're going to be married. We're going to take it one year at a time. But if we take it one year at a time, maybe we'll make it. I can tell you guys all right now, I think we can make it for one year. Every year we've taken it one year at a time. We're at the 14th year. We just crossed 14th year, okay? Two, I said, if you come to my wife at any time without us telling you, if my wife is pregnant, you will never see us again. It's none of your business. You go through me and you don't ask that question because you don't get to put that kind of pressure under my wife and say, you guys are not getting pregnant? Are you sick? Are you, mm -hmm. Is it him? Is this thing not working? Is your thing not working? Don't ask me that question because you'll never see us. And I'm being, I have some levity while I'm saying this where it's not like I'm being a drill sergeant talking to right. everybody, but it's a way of managing expectation where my wife feels safe to know, you know what? We're gonna be okay. I think if you ask that from the man's standpoint, there's an element to it as a husband. There's an element to it as a father. There's an element to it as a son to protect your father. There's an element to it as a brother to make sure nobody messes with your siblings. Then there's an element to it when you become a CEO of a company to know that you're a formidable guy, that people are not going to bully your company, and if they do, you're going to have their backs, you're going to stand up. In politics, eventually, you get to a point where if you become a president, 
fortunately, one of the biggest problems we've got in America right now is those three components that I talked about, love, fear, respect. Love, fear, respect. If a father has all those three, your trifecta. If, if, you, if you are loved and you know how to love, if you know how to impose the right amount of fear, and if you are respected, you have the mixture, that, that makes for the best cocktail of parenting and leadership. As a president, as a president, if the enemy fears you, if the enemy respects you, it doesn't matter if they love you. But if they fear and respect you, chaos are down. We have a president today, unfortunately, that's not feared, that's not respected, and is not loved. What happens worldwide? Chaos. When you have leaders at the top, at the top leading the way as the number one alpha, and there's not fear, respect, and love, catastrophic situation you're in. And that happens in marriages, companies, parenti- parenting, as well as countries. Loving America shouldn't be political. I wish I could say who the following person is because people know him. Uh, but I have uh, somebody I'm friendly with. I would not call him a friend. I just don't know him well enough. But uh, people certainly know his family. And he said, oh, I put an American flag up in front of my house. And I was like, I guarantee that's going to get torn down. He was like, yeah, it already has been. And I, I was like, oh, I hated that, I, that that was obvious, that in Los Angeles, flying a flag is a political statement that for many borders on right-wing extremist. And that is so startling to me as a child of the 80s where I was supremely proud to be an American. It was awesome and I could take it for granted. I mean, obviously not everybody in America loved America, but that's how it seemed. I thought all of us, like there was just enough people that were so proud of America that you could take for granted. So I never knowingly ran into anybody that didn't love America as a kid. It was an awesome feeling. And as that has waned, I've often said to my employees, like, I'm sad that you guys didn't get to grow up in the 80s when you knew, and look, true, not true, almost doesn't matter, but you knew America was the greatest country in the world, that the world was gonna get better by the day, you knew who the bad guys were, you knew who the good guys were, and you were it. Like we were exporting our culture everywhere. Everybody wanted to come to America. It was awesome. And to have watched that flag is crazy. Now for me, the way that the, you you speak as a um, warrior for the cause, that's my language, clearly not yours, but like that's how you feel to me. And that isn't my natural voice. And I get a lot of shit from people I respect a lot. Um, in the natural way that I talk. Uh, You said I was very sweet. I'm actually not trying to be sweet. I'm trying to exist in the world of actually understanding all the pieces that are at play so I can build a strategy that will actually be effective. And so what I see is that you're you're in a, a fight over values. And as long as you understand that you're in a fight over values, and then you can either realize you have to convert them religiously because values are religion. You have to convert them religiously or you have to defeat them. I won't even get into what that means, but those are your options. And so I'm simply trying to be honest with myself about what what the battle really is, because it isn't that they don't understand your position. It's that they think you are wrong and that you are going to ruin lives. And I think that's how you think about them, that it is... Uh, they are wrong and they're going to ruin lives. And I will say people with ineffective ideology are wrong and they're going to ruin lives. That's certainly my stance. So then it just becomes a question of where do we, where are we all drawing lines about what's right and what's wrong? But once you want, like to me, there are only two conflicts you can have. There is um, much to do about nothing where you just have different base assumptions. So we believe different things to be true, but we don't even realize it. So I believe the world works this way. You believe the world works that way. And if we could at least explain that to each other, then we could be like, oh, wow. If the world really did work that way, then I would understand why you see it that way. Collision of values is there is a God. God is good. God is right. And God gives us these commandments in a book. And if you adhere to them, you're good. And if you don't adhere to them, you're bad. Now, if I don't have that value, now we've got a problem. Because there's, it's not that you don't understand what I'm saying. Like, I don't believe in God. As far as I can tell, it is just self-evident that there is no God. Now, however, and this gets where fucking I drive people crazy, 
But since I know everyone has a God-shaped hole in their heart and that you eject religion at your fucking peril, and what we are living through right now is this is what it looks like when you eject religion. It will get filled with something because people have a God-shaped hole in their heart. They are going to have a religion. They are going to have something that makes them feel like a Messiah, 100%. And the fact, I've heard you talk about this, so I know you know, George Sor Soros literally referred to himself as a god and said that I have a messiah complex uh, that I worry sometimes will get out of control. It's like, yeah, that's the human condition. And so we all want to feel like we have done something so grand and so joyful to this world that we feel a bit of that messiah complex. And I'm team be paranoid, distrust yourself. That's my team. I think people blind themselves and act a fucking fool and they take everybody down with them. Now, I'm also optimistic and I know that we're capable of love. And so right now I have kind of a, uh, a dark hat on because I want people to understand what my position is. My position is people are fucking stupid. They do dumb shit all the time. And I'm one of those dumb people. And so I'm really trying to understand what's actually happening because I have my God, as you said earlier, they have their God, and I could get them to understand my God, which is probably rounded closest to freedom. And they're still going to disagree. And now, because I know how violent and destructive humans can be, for the last three years, I have been like, ooh, you know when an earthquake first starts? You don't know if it's going to be bad or really minor. When 2020 popped off, I'm very fortunate to have an extraordinary view. But from that extraordinary view, I could see LA burning. And one of the photos on Twitter was a picture of my house. And it said, burn the rich. And I'm watching LA burn as I'm reading that tweet. And I'm like, well then, I feel the ground slipping underneath me and I don't know how bad it gets. And so I opened all this with, now's the time for paranoia. I don't know what the future holds. Maybe tomorrow everything's great and Israel diffuses and Ukraine and Russia diffuse and all is well and Taiwan gets left alone for another generation. Maybe, that'd be awesome. And I don't know, I don't know. I can't predict the future. But God damn, can I feel the sands moving under my feet? Yes. Do I know if it's about to be big or small? No. Why do you create content? Why did I start or why do I do it now? Why do you do it now? You don't have to do it. You, you, you have plenty of money. Why do you do it? You're trying to be famous? I don't no. think so. I don't You're, have... Why do you create content? I need to be famous. Uh, I create content because yeah, I... I don't, I don't think that's you. I, I don't see you as a guy that's doing it because you want... Can I take a selfie with you, Tom? I don't see you as a guy like that. Yeah. Uh, I do it for one reason and one reason only. I really believe that I am of average intelligence and the thing that separates me and my beautiful house and all my money is, that separates me and all of that from an average person is a set of ideas. And these ideas don't feel like they are mine. I feel like I am a steward of, uh, if I were really gonna put like hard language to it, I'm a steward of, the Tao Te Ching meets Carol Dweck's mindset book with a little bit of Angela Duckworth and Jocko Willink thrown in for good measure. Those ideas are so powerful and so effective that if anyone adopts them, they will make their life better. Now, once you know that that is true, if you have my wiring, then you want to get those ideas out as fast as you fucking can. So A, I love seeing other people have that moment of awakening where they realize that they're capable of more. And I'll tell you a story, and this is, um, this is a true fucking story, and it's one of my favorite stories. It's, it's tragic, but I know it was real. Uh, somebody I love and care about very much who at a time when nobody knew who I was, and I'm driving a Ford Focus, I meet a former drug dealer, and he's working for me. And I say, look, don't bring violence to my floor and I'll give you every opportunity in the world because I can tell you're smart. And so we have this pact and he comes in and he works and he's incredible and he helps me unify a line made up of both Crips and Bloods, long story. 
And he's like, hey, originally I was gonna use this job as a front for my drug money, but like you've really shown me that I can actually leverage my intelligence to, to do something straight. Ended up being awesome. This guy turned his life around, turned his family's life around. It was unbelievable. It's one of the things I'm most proud of in my life is just having been some small part of this guy's transformation. Ends up getting killed by two kids who stole a car. Fucking stupid, but whatever. At his funeral, his daughter came up to me and said, um, actually, she said this from the front of the room. I want to thank Tom and Lisa. We all know my dad was a gangster. And you, she didn't say taught him ideas, but just to bring it full circle, you taught him a set of ideas. They changed his life and they changed mine. And she ended up going from almost getting kicked out of school to uh, being valedictorian of her class like seven years later. I mean, it was just absolutely unbelievable. Uh, and she's like, our lives will never be the same because of these ideas. And dude, my whole life, because I believe in meaning and purpose, it's the most important thing. I'm highly verbal. I know I'm good at this. And so eight years ago, I said, put me in front of a camera and I will get these ideas out to the world aggressively. And that's why I do it. Interesting. So um, profound story with that guy, by the way. You know, if you don't bring violence to your blood, Crips unifies, then still in the car, they kill him. Um, you know, I, I, I think there are certain people who have the ability to communicate a message and get people to see uh, things that others cannot see are almost responsible to do something with those gifts. You can choose to be 100% selfish and not do anything with it, or you can choose to do with it, which you are doing a lot with, with the ideas where the daughter says, you know, set of ideas that change the way I view things. Let's set faith aside. Forget faith. We're not debating faith or God. This is not the podcast to do faith or God. That's a simply a different conversation over dinner, if we even ever do it. But if you're a math guy and you're a data guy and you're a guy that knows X plus Y equals Z, then you know what works and what doesn't work. You know what philosophies work and doesn't work. You can take the position of, you know, Patrick, you have your ideas and the people in California have their own ideas and, you know, they have their reasons for that and you as a capitalist, you know, freedom, all this stuff, it's this, great. But there has to be a way to measure and see which ideas produce better results. And then if you do, which is proven, then what's our job to do? Is our job to sit on the sidelines and not offend the people who were wrong and let them keep harping and convincing others that they're right? Is our job to sit on the sidelines and allow them to keep confusing kids in universities? Is that our job to do? Is our job to allow these guys that keep asking for $60,000 of tuition today, which when you look at inflation and cost of living, where cost of living's increased since 1980, 212%, but cost of education has increased 1,200%? Oof. It, 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 a thousand, you mean education has improved 1,000% over the last 40 years? You and I know it hasn't. You and I know a four-year degree doesn't have any more meaning today than it did in 1980s. Maybe it had more meaning in 1980 than today because For today sure. our teachers are For more political sure. figures and they're more social you know, organizers dividing people against each other. Yeah, so I think, I think for me, I'm not worried about the faith conversation. I know what it is to be an atheist. I was one for 25 years. I have my own reasons for doing what I did. For me, it's more about a numbers guy, a data guy, who watched everybody on my mother's side believed in rich people were greedy, and my dad's side believed poor people are lazy. And from my mom's side, who were communists, whose Bible was the Communist Manifesto, and my dad was an imperialist, it took me 20 years to realize who was right, maybe even 25, 30 years to realize who was right. We had a family relative of ours, his name was Luther al Hasse, amazing man. This was my guy I looked at, okay? When we were, when I was a kid, we'd go to his house in Upland, you know where Upland is, Upland is a couple hours away from here, San Antonio Boulevard, closer to like uh, Rancho Cucamonga is where it's at, like an hour and a half away from here, okay? Yeah. Without traffic, it's 45 minutes to an hour. Once a year, we'd go to his house, 
You go all the way up San Antonio, then you make a left on the street, and at the end it's his house. You had a massive 40 foot bird nest here, bird cage here. You'd pull up, he always had a Cadillac parked here, he liked Jaguar, and his one of his relatives, Alfred, would live here above the parking lot, above the garage. And then you walk into the door, to the right was his office, you walk a little bit more, hallway, all the way down is his bedroom. He had a jacuzzi in his bedroom, living room here. You'd make a left, come down here is the kitchen, big island. I would always sit closest to the uh, window, my back's to the street. I would sit here, and I would watch them talk, because I'm not family. My dad was best friends with his brother since they were born in Iran. So Luther was an entrepreneur. He made a lot of money. He owned golf courses. If you went straight, you made a left, you came here, there was a pool table, he had a picture on the wall, everybody was dressed white, family, daughter, son, everybody, and then he had a picture with Al Gore, even though he was a conservative. Why do you have a picture with Al Gore? Good friends with Al Gore, as a conservative, okay. And he would go outside, he had a big TV here, we would watch the Bulls play. Pool, swimming pool outside, changing room here, like a small little one-bedroom place, basketball court, tennis court here, and he had a garden of fruit and all this stuff. And I would watch him, how he would be with his kids. He would always poke and challenge him to debate issues. He would say, I no longer believe in God. At a moment today, you guys have been sold a bag of lies. Jesus wasn't real. And his kid, would, they would lose their minds. And they would go on a three-hour debate. And he would say, okay, I'm back to believing again. And he would say next thing, such and such president is making a worse decision ever. How could you say that? that? And it, it was always, how could you say that? And the whole family was debating. I was fascinated. Every year I'd see him. So from 13 years old till 18, I saw him seven times. And I saw this guy as a possibility of one day I can be like him. Anyways, later on in life, I ended up winning in business. And he died four years ago, three or four years ago, where I had Rafi's place in Glendale. And his daughter sees me, Jackie. And his uh, son, uh, Vladimir, who's a pastor now in San Jose, when I was a troubled teenager, he invited me to be part of this basketball organization called the Century City Basketball Association. Century City Basketball. We would play at Echo Park. Terrible community, Echo Park. So like, not a safe place at that time. Not a terrible community. Not a safe place. So shootings, all this stuff, blood, crib, black diamonds. Everybody would be there and we'd play basketball. Mara Sabatrucha, all of us. So he was patient with me as a kid. And then I joined the army and boom. So we're at Rafi's place. And I said, Jackie, I want to say something to your dad. He says, great. I said, you mind if I come over? No problem. 20 people are sitting at that table to have a big family. I says, Uncle Luther, can I tell you something? He says, yes. He stands up. I speak to him in Assyrian and English. Like it's like Assyrian English together, Aramaic. I say, you don't know this, but for 10 minutes I recite vivid memories I have of what this man did. Okay? And I kept saying, you did this one time and you would do this and you would do that. And you said this to your daughter one time. He said this to your son. I was sitting there when you confused them with faith and business and this, this, that. And this is how you would watch Michael play and magic play. And you would do this. And he, I'm describing his entire house. He no longer lives in that house. He's crying. I said, you don't know this, but you're the reason I'm a businessman today. Mm. If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. My dad played a role of love and being a man. But you played the role of me being an entrepreneur. He inspired me. And at 33 years old, I go to my mom. And I said, Mom, can I ask you a question? Yes. Why did you always say bad things about Luther? Well, what did he do to you? You always said he's rich, he's greedy, he's this, he's that. And my mom, I respect her a lot for what she said to me. She says, you know what? Maybe because once he made the money and he was running his companies, we never saw him again. I said, Mom, he's busy. He's running businesses. He, we're not family to him. Said, no, you're probably right. But I didn't like the fact that I didn't see him because I actually liked him. Like, you tell me this at 33 years old. Do you know how much this affected me when I was 13, 14 years old? I thought this was a bad man. He says, no, you're right. And we just had this conversation. My mom's no longer a communist, but at that time, you know, that's the... What's the point here? <laughs> the point here is, if you have proof that a certain way of ideas and philosophies works, sell it constantly and protect it and defend it. Don't play vanilla, don't play neutral. I think sometimes us, you're no longer a small time guy, bro. You're a very big guy. We got a lot of influence. You got a lot of people that follow what you gotta say. And you are very, you know, when you kind of, you do your humble brag, you're a super smart guy. You're like, 
you're a super smart guy. I'm not at your level of, you're a very, very smart guy on the way you process issues and what way you can talk and you're very reasonable and non-emotional. You stay, you know, where you are when you're explaining it. Um, I think it's a risk for us not to defend the logical things that prove that way worked better. And then we sell it over and over and over again because eventually you're going to produce 50 other town bill use, 100 other town bill use, and that's all it's going to take. You're not going to need to have another million town bill use. You just need 100 town bill use. If another 100 town bill use do what you do, then we're protected the next 20, 40 years. But if we're a little bit too timid and too careful to defend ideas that have proven to have worked, again, set aside faith. You can take faith any way you want to take it. I think we have to be um, louder warriors, like you use. I use that word. True believer crusaders of selling. Guys, people bitch about the rich people don't pay taxes. You know what percentage of taxes rich pay? The top 5% pays 80% of taxes. What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. No, AOC said this. No, no, this is pure data. How dare you say that? No, no, how dare she say that and confuse the shit out of you? This is data, guys. This is not for me. This is how tax was paid to the IRS. I never knew that. You sure about this? Go verify it. It's on the U.S. government website. That's insane. Of course it is. But they sold you a bag of goods and you bought it because it was for sale. Stop going to Macy's and looking for sale ideas. Pay full retail. And don't buy these ideas that are nonsense because they're stealing decades away from your life. That's the only difference for me where, like I remember five years ago when I started, three years ago when I started talking politics, dude, trust me, I remember what everybody in the marketplace said about me. I know exactly what people were saying about me because word would come back to me and they would say, kiss of death for PBD, he's done. We had three million subscribers at the time and I um, decided to talk politics. And I'm like, dude, I don't know how to do this part because I know it's going to piss a lot of people off. But I'm respectful and I'm curious and I'll talk to anybody. I don't care who you are. You can be a communist professor from, you know, Riverside County. You can be, you know, Slavo Zizek. You can be anybody. I'll sit down with you. Let's have a conversation. Noam Chomsky, come on down. Let's talk. I don't have any problem, right? But we started a podcast on a separate channel with zero subscribers. Our first live podcast was 57 people watching us. We got seven comments. We were so excited. Now imagine how hard that is to do because you got a 3 million subscriber channel on this oh. side and now you have to start from scratch, right? I you know, know about well, this. Yeah. No, I know you know about this. And then all of a sudden that grows and now Value Tim, we just crossed 5 million today and PBD Podcast is at 1.45, whatever it's at, right? And we're getting, you know, however many eyeballs on a monthly basis. What happened? Was it a risk? Yes. Did we get people thinking? Yes. People stop me now. They're like, man, I got to tell you, man, I never missed a podcast. How about the entrepreneur? I watched that stuff, but I really want to know what you think about current events and da, da 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 Very interesting. What does this mean? This means I think people want to know a little bit more about what Tom Bilyeu thinks. That's all I'm saying. Maybe they want to know a little bit more because that brain has a lot to offer. And, and the life you've experienced can give people perspective but more from a position of there is a scoreboard. This philosophy won, but this philosophy is louder. Don't let the noise convince you that this philosophy is not working. Mm -hmm. This is the right way to live. I think we have to sell that. And I think some people are afraid of doing that at that level. And let me ask this question. So let's, let's have a little bit of a banter here, exchange. I like this. A, um, what... what causes a company to attract tens, meaning if you read Stephen Schwartzman's books, book, in it he talks about how at one point, 30 billion auto guy, at one point he realized it's all about hiring tens. Not nines, not eights, but hiring tens. But most people can't afford tens. When you read Reed Hastings, No Rules Rules, they realize a 10 is the equivalent of 28s, okay? One 10 is the same as 28. Sounds what? about right. Sounds about right. Okay. So what causes a company to attract tens? 
You want me to give you the breakdown? I want to hear from you. Yeah. Okay. So number one is going to be uh, a mission that is bigger than whatever mission they have in their own life that they are very excited about. Next one is going to be um, that you're building something that is novel and is actually going to allow them to bring the full weight of their talent and intelligence to bear. Um, so they're not retreading old stuff. This is really something new. Got it. Um, the world actually wants the product. Uh, they are compensated well. They have a sense of ownership, autonomy, um, and they're surrounded by other tens. Okay, so compensated well, did you say autonomy? Autonomy. Okay, yeah. and then last one was you're surrounded around other tents. Yes. Okay. I'm not going to ask you how many tents you have here because I don't want to cause a fight, but <laughs> uh, uh, we won't go there surrounded by- It isn't all tens. Okay. I think yeah, even I'm my team you. knows that. So, so, so when you look at this, compelling mission, novel, you know, full- uh, uh, you know, uh, where we're going, what we're doing. World actually wants the prop, uh, product, compensated well, autonomy, surrounded by tents. To me, um, what does Blackstone do to get tents? Is the mission that insane? I don't know. Um, what does Netflix do to get tents? What, what does Yahoo do to lose tents to Facebook? What does Facebook do to lose tents? To Google, what what does um, what 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 are tens attracted to? To me, everything here. You could have an incredible mission. Check. You could have novel. Man, this is we're doing a really big thing. Historic. Check. World actually wants the product. Check. If the incentive program sucks, you're not attracting those people. Period. Let me make go a little bit deeper for you. You live in the great state of California. You know California, how many people they lost between California and New York the last last year? 1.4 million. 1.4 million. You saw the stat. Do you know what state in America's 50th place for the most people lost last year? California. California. Do you know what state's number one? Flo uh, Florida's number for one. receiving? Net positive. Net positive population growth, Florida's Over number Texas. one. Texas. Texas number two. Hmm. Then you got Carolinas. This just came out, by the way, a very interesting number for you to look at because at the bottom is... California, New York, Illinois. Okay. The economy is bigger in California. The economy is bigger in New York. The economy is bigger in a lot of different places. Why are they leaving? Because the incentive sucks. So if a state with better incentives is in place like Florida, which means what? You keep your state taxes. If in Texas, you keep your state taxes. Tennessee, keep your state taxes. We'll figure it out. In California, why are gas prices in some places seven bucks? Why are gas prices in certain places five bucks, six bucks? You got this gas tax on top of this gas tax. On top, how come the other states don't have the gas tax? These are the incentive programs. Why did one of the biggest liberals in America that try to save the world, you really want to talk about climate change? No one probably did more good for climate change, like try to do good for climate change than a guy named Elon Musk who voted for Obama, who voted for all these guys, who voted for Hillary, and this guy moves to Austin, Texas. Why would he do that? Why did the guy who tried to legalize marijuana for the longest time, who said, I'm voting for Bernie Sanders, what, what is he doing moving to Texas? A guy named Joe Rogan. Why did 40,000 employees leave Toyota go to Texas? Because of the incentive program. So where am I going with this? I, you and I are in the same place where everything starts off with you and I. Like, what do I control? What can I do about it, right? And as you get to a different level, I'm sure you've paid a lot of taxes. If I were to ask you about how much taxes you paid, you paid a lot of taxes for the money you've made. You guys build a billion auto company. Mm -hmm. When you have a billion auto company and you've taken money off the table multiple times, you know, and you're doing it in this state, you could have your capital gains 23.8, but you got to add that 13.3 on top of it. So in your yeah. state, you sell, you get $200 million in the state of California, you're going to pay roughly $80 million in taxes. But Aren't you do you that trust? in Florida or Texas, you're going to pay $60 million, $50 million in taxes. That $30 million stays in your pocket. Guess what? That's pretty attractive incentive-wise. Yep. What else when you look at it? You look at other people that want to live as well. The average person that's making sixty grand a year in California, dude, you have to live 80 miles away in Palmdale to be able to make it. And Palmdale's even getting expensive today, quartz hill. you got only a couple of pockets you can live to be able to survive with the kind of pay that this uh, marketplace is paying you. So 
when I'm going back to the question and you said, well, what percentage of people are really going to be thinking about that question? This is the problem that we have. We think we have to win everybody over. We don't. We think we have to convert a 50% of the population. You don't. It's the 12% in the middle that run America. That's who runs America. You got 47% that's going to vote Democrat no matter what. You got 44% that's going to vote Republican no matter what. Then you have that middle, whatever that number is going to be that you're dealing with, you know, maybe it's going to be 42, 44, then you got the libertarians, the green, all this other stuff. The independents and libertarians rule America. So if those guys who have the ability to have courage, to have a change of thought, and are neutral, neutrality, and are willing to accept alternative solutions, and they're able to reason, well, guess what? They watch a podcast like this and say, shit, this makes a lot of sense. We have to change incentives. So what do we do? Either one, you say, did I have no desire to get into politics? So how can I help? Okay, no problem. Go back somebody up that you can feel that they can do it and start recruiting people to run. You know, behind closed doors, I'm recruiting people to run. Like I'm talking to people and saying, you got a lot of values that people would love. I think you ought to consider it. Really? Yes, you ought to consider it. Oh, I never thought about that. I think you should think about that. Why don't you read these three books, see if it does anything to you. Why don't you go look at what the Bushes and the Kennedys had as a legacy. Their legacy was simple in their family. You make money first, you take care of your wife, you take care of your uh, kids. They have enough money to not have to worry about anything. They're set for school and all that stuff. You set yourself up a little bit of retirement. If you want to make a little bit more money, go for it. But last but not least, you got to give back to the country that gave you this incredible life. How do you do it? Nonprofit, okay? You either go into politics or church. But somehow, some way, you got to contribute. So I, I want more, like I used to not care about politics at all until I realized America's problem is, is the incentive program. The reason why we went from 4% of kids being born to single mothers in 1940 to 40% today is because of the incentive program. The reason why we have so many divorces in the world, we are leading the world in divorces in ways that doesn't even make any sense. We're at, we're at 23.8. Some numbers you look at where China and India are at 3 or 4%. Our incentive program sucks. When you look at small business owners, when you look at people going out there fighting for, let's print more money. Every time these guys print more money, guys like you get richer. Every time they print money, you and I make more money because your money's in assets and your money's in equities. And that money's going to go to these equities. So the valuation of these companies flips like right now everybody's worried about a market crash. You know what's bigger than a market crash today? You know what scares me more than a market crash today? A reverse market crash. You know what's a reverse market crash? It's what happened in Venezuela this year. Imagine stock market goes from 10000 to 64000 What? Like right now, we have interest rates at, four per, at 8%, eight and a quarter some places, but let's just say 8%. And, and real estate prices are going up. It's the least amount of refi we've done in 27 years. Refi application is at the lowest for 27 years. And the amount of inventory of homes for sale right now is the lowest we've had in 20 years. But real estate prices are going up. How? So imagine if Powell today takes this 8%. And he brings it down to seven, to six, to five, to four. What happens? Market Dow goes to 60,000, 40,000, 50,000. Why? It's not because the economy is doing good, because we have that money in the market. It's going somewhere. So what happens? All of these people that we're talking about, wow, look at the rich getting richer, the poor getting poor. Your policies are printing more money. It's causing the rich to get too richer and the poor to get poor because the disparity is getting wider. If the rich are making 12% on their money and the poor are making zero because they have it in checking accounts, what do you think is going to happen every year? That distance is going to get bigger. So what do we have this year in 2023? Most strikes we've ever had. You ever seen any, this many strikes in our lifetime? We're three years apart, you and I. I've never seen this many strikes. UAW strike, finally agreed, 42 bucks an hour. You got UPS strike. You got Walgreens, CVS. You got Kaiser, 75,000. You got... There's so many strikes going on today. What are people saying? Dude, I can't make it. I can't make the money. In, in your state, California, uh, they raised the minimum wage for fast food restaurants to whatever the number is, 22 bucks. And you know what Chipotle and McDonald's just announced? They're raising prices. Why? Because they have to. How are they going to make that money? You can raise minimum wage all you want. The restaurant is going to raise the prices. They're going to have to raise the prices. So now, all these automakers that are sitting around saying, oh, you want us to pay these guys 42 bucks an hour? No problem. 
guess what? The consumer is going to have to pay $1,500 more for the car they buy. Is the consumer okay with that? Because that's how math works. Mm. Math works that way. So to me, at this phase of my life, if a person's 20 years old watching this, don't worry about what we talked about the last 20 minutes. Just go make your money. If a person's 30 years old watching this and they got a wife and kid and their career's like here, they're about to kind of go, focus on your career, pay a little bit of attention to this. But if you're 40 plus, 45 plus, and you're seeing what's really going on in the economy, and you're like, what the hell are all these policies? I love my state of Illinois, but what the hell are we doing here? I love New York, but what the hell is going on in New York? I love San Francisco, but it's no longer San Francisco. Then you have to pay very close attention to the different incentive programs in other states and ask, why can't we do that in California? Why are we not doing that in New York? Why are we not doing that in Illinois? People in California are not asking those questions. So uh, I love this compelling mission, novelty, you know, novel. World actually wants the product compensation, autonomy surrounded by tents. But at the basic, most simplest thing is our incentive program at the top of our U.S. government today. And by many states, absolutely sucks. It's interesting. So um, let's have a collision of visions here. So I think that every word you said is true. It is necessary, but not sufficient to understand what's really happening. So it show me the incentives and I'll show you the outcome. So says uh, Mr. Munger, and he is correct when a system becomes deranged. So when you're talking about an incentive program, which I know you leading sales teams have experienced the madness that ensues when you get something a little bit wrong in your incentive structure and it incentivizes terrible behavior. I've seen that up close. Uh, being in Web3, I've seen that up close where suddenly people are treating something that should be fun like a video, uh, treating something that should be fun like it's a, um, a roulette wheel or a gambling machine. And so for sure, people are going to find like whatever little minuscule thing that they um, can exploit. But to me, the key is to avoid deranging the system as much as humanly possible. And the way that you avoid deranging the system as much as humanly possible is to give people values. Right now, my big problem is that people are not being inculcated with values. And I can't believe I'm saying this because I am like the least conservative guy on the planet. However, I am so obsessed with what fucking works. Like, what, what is the outcome that you want? If the outcome that you want is the America that you see or wherever in the world you are, okay, great, then whatever you're doing is working. For me, this seems like uh, as close to a humanitarian crisis as you're going to get in the West. I mean, when I was a kid, I really believed I could do anything I set my mind to. And because I believe that, I went and did it. Mm. But if you don't, like I would do, so I've worked in the inner cities a lot. And the first time I heard a kid say, uh, I was like, why aren't you even trying? Like, bro, you're so smart. Why aren't you trying? Like, why, why are you here working for minimum wage? This is crazy. I'll teach you anything you want to know about how to grow and climb up in the world. And he goes, oh, uh, my mom told me that the world doesn't want people that look like me to succeed. And I was like, so fucking what? That's the worst advice ever. Assume it's true. Assume it's true. Assume everyone is against you. Now what? You're just going to take it? You're just going to take the first minimum wage job on a line that you can get? You're not going to like push yourself. You're not going to, again, develop personal power. Get so good at something. We both love Kobe. You got to meet him and I did not. But he's got my favorite quote. Booze don't block dunks. You can get so good at something that people can't stop you. Even if they hate you, even if they're paid millions of dollars to be better than you, to stop you from doing a thing, this guy still scored 81 points by himself in a single game. Okay, in a game where often 80 plus points is all that's scored. Pure insanity. And so if this is why, like, I don't have kids. So the odds of me suffering from what I can see coming are very low. It is but a love for humanity that makes me want to scream. The whole idea of impact theory is I really believe the ideas that you believe about the world matter so much they will control the quality of your life. And so now I'm just trying to make sure that people get high quality ideas about self-ownership, about what you're capable of, about everybody should be 
trying to build as much personal strength as humanly possible so that they can do the things that they want to do in many different areas. So getting people to understand all 10 fingers of responsibility should be pointed back at you, that if we want people to build a society that is better, they must believe in a grand vision. There must be a mission to their life, to the lives of others. That mission must have some tie to measurable results so that we don't just do what feels good or sounds good. We do what actually works. And so to me, there is a massive restructuring of the way that we think about raising kids, about the way, certainly my contribution is once you come to work for me, cool. I'm not gonna raise you. I'm not gonna raise my own children. It's not the way that I'm playing. But God damn it, when you come inside of impact theory, we are gonna run this in a way that's going to be effective. It's going to make you a better version of yourself. It's going to make you a better version of however you're contributing to the company. And that shit is a non-negotiable. So everybody has to sign a culture document that says, and I quote, you must be a hardcore motherfucker. Like period, end of story. And if PS, that turns you off, great. This is not the place for you. But I know what it takes to actually fight against the chaos of the world. And you're going to have to choose your enemy wisely. In fact, this is something we haven't talked about yet. Part of what I'm trying to get them to, now I think you have to balance the beauty of what you're trying to do. I'm trying to make sure nobody gets to the age of 15 without encountering a growth mindset at scale through entertainment and ideas. Cool. But then, you also need to be able to tap into the dark energy. And that to me is about an ability to capture the energy output of the fire in your belly for lack of a more literal expression. So tell me why when picking an enemy, it needs to be somebody that really makes me feel some kind of way. Because uh, choosing an enemy, how do you judge an enemy? There's 14 different types of enemy we talk about in the book, but the way you judge an enemy is the lifespan of how long that enemy can drive you. You may have an enemy that drives you for a day. You may have an enemy that drives you for 30 seconds. Somebody cuts you off. You got an enemy for about 30 seconds, okay? You may have an enemy that drives you for a month. Somebody you're going up against for a sales contest. I'm going to beat that guy. Okay, cool. Short lifespan. Not a big deal. Then you find an enemy that drives you for five, 10 years, 20 years. Now you got something good. Unfortunately, Tom, most people choose the wrong enemy uh, when, they're, when they're competing. I wanna read something to you. Is this the book or is this a different book? Uh, I think it's is, the is book. Is this the book? Let me see if this is a book. I'm gonna, I'm gonna open this up and see if this is the book or not. Let's see here. All right, hang on one second. If it is, I wanna read this to you. Oh shit, they sent you the heart. Look at that. Look at you, buddy. Respect. I don't even have this. Literally, I I'm telling it. you, I don't even have this. Who? Funny thing is, I didn't get it either. I got a PDF. So when I saw it here, I was like, All Who right. sent this to you? Do you know who I sent it? I don't know. The team. Really? So Penguin sent it. Uh, no, yours. Okay. Well, I don't have this. I don't have this copy. That's fantastic. Go. Sam sent it? Eason. Eason sent it. So you got it directly from Penguin. Just nice. so you know, this is the first time I'm seeing a cover copy of this. Let me read this to you. Yeah. Okay. Two quotes. One, a wise man gets more use from his enemies than a fool from his friends. Baltazar Gracian. Let me read the other one for you, which fires me up. Okay. You have no enemies, you say. My friend, the boast is poor. He who has mingled in the fray of duty that the brave endure must have made foes. If you have none, small is the work that you have done. You've hit no traitor on the hip. You've dashed no cuff from the perjured, perjured lip. You've never turned a wrong to right. You've been a coward in the fight. Charles Mackey, okay? All right, so you read this. Coward, I'm not a coward. I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to be categorized as that. Totally get it. But if you're, if you're going to be doing something big, you're automatically going to have some enemies. Now, we're looking at Elon Musk earlier and we're talking about him and you look at Elon who's been driving for this long, everybody asks, isn't this guy worth $300 billion? Yeah. What are you doing buying Twitter when you're worth $300 billion? You're already running SpaceX. You're already running Tesla. You got these trucks that all of us are waiting for, okay? You gotta figure what happens with that rock you threw out the glass that the glass broke, we gotta fix that, right? 
And at the same time, how many kids do you have? Nine or 10 kids? And you're doing podcasts. You're always on podcasts. You're interviewing with people. How the hell do you have time to sleep? Why would you buy Twitter? And now you're the most second most hated guy in America. You didn't become a friendly person when you bought Twitter. That's crazy. You got worse. Why would you want to do something like that? Psychologically, you have to have issues. So then you ask the question, okay, say this guy in three years is the first trillionaire. Say it happens in a year. What do you think he's doing the next day after he becomes a trillionaire? You think he's taking three months off and going to Monaco? No, not him. Why? Because while the world thinks this guy is doing it for money, he's not doing it for the money. He's on a mission. Okay, fair. But why at that level? Because he's got something that drives him that none of us know about. Could it be his father? Very high likely that could be his father. Could it be something else we don't know about? Of course. Could it be what these, you know, astronauts said about him and made fun of him that we think space experiments should only be done by the government and not by free enterprise and free market? Maybe. And it got him tears. If you've never seen that 60-minute interview, I'm sure you have, right? It could be. But it's him. Now, Michael, Jordan, same thing. Tom Brady, talking to him, same thing. Anybody you admire that's able to tolerate the kind of pain required to win at the highest level, they have an enemy that drives them. They're just not telling you about it. Most people will never disclose who the true enemy is. It's private. Bill Clinton in this one book, uh, it's called uh, Hypomanic Edge and you know, First Rate Madness. I don't know if you've read these books or not. Uh, it talks about bipolar, hypomanic, you know, ADHD, why all these people that end up doing something big, they typically are a little bit off. How does this guy, how is he capable of going 18 hours straight and he's still doing it? And he, but what's wrong with this guy? How can he do that? There's that element that they just can't help themselves, right? Yeah. Well, Clinton, you know, they asked him about his mom, him and his mom. His mom drove him a lot. Most people don't know about this. And in one of the interviews, he said, there's no benefit from me saying anything bad about my mom. Literally, there's no benefit for a man to say anything bad about their moms. You're not gonna win. You're never gonna be able to convince the marketplace you had a bad mom as a man. You can do it as a woman, you cannot do it as a man. The market's gonna be like, how dare you say something? Now, men can talk trash about their dads, the market will receive it, they'll make a movie about it, right? But you can't do it about your mom. That was Clinton's who drove him, you know? People have it, people now at the same time, you know, 14 types of enemies in the book that I talk about, you know, there's also the concept of choosing the wrong enemy that could steal decades from your life, decades away from your life, hypothetically. I'm doing an event at the Vault Conference, okay? This is two years ago. And on the first night, we go through a personal audit questionnaire that you got to go through. And the next morning, you got to come back and talk about it with the group. And we're looking to see who's going to have a breakthrough based on the questions that you have to answer. Okay, no problem. These are 83 questions that I went through back in 2003 at the Matador Beach here by Zuma. I'm sitting there going through myself, crying like a little baby with my notepad, yellow notepad that I'm answering these questions. I had to break through. Boom. I added these into this list that people are going through and they get to experience it for themselves. Who do you get along with? Who do you not get along with? Is there a pattern of people that piss you off the most? Why is that? Who do they remind you of? These types of things that kind of for you to see what you're going through. So the next day, 2,000 people in attendance. Everybody's giving theirs, husband and wife, this is the breakthrough we have. You know, another one is the breakthrough we had. One girl over here, not getting up, her, her sister's like elbowing her. My sister wants to say something. I think she really had a big, big breakthrough. Babe, what are you doing? Babe, you gotta tell him, babe, tell him. Okay, she gets up. She says, Pat, this is very hard. I said, what is it? So let me tell you who I am. I've done very well as a person who runs her own business. I make more money than all my exes, I make more money than the guys of my life. I make more money than any of my teachers. I do very, very well with the salon I run. I make very good money. My people make very good money. I have a nice house. I drive a nice car. I have money in the bank. I have all the Chanel purses, everything. I said, okay, so what's the point? But I'm alone. Mm. I'm not married. I don't have any kids. I don't have a family. I don't have somebody to look forward to coming home to and talking to, celebrating any of this. I said, where are you going with this? She says, for the longest time, men have been the enemy. And I realized they're not. I'm wasting my time having men as an enemy. If you've ever seen a movie, Jerry Maguire, where all the divorced women are sitting around the table and they're bitching about men and their husbands and all this stuff, and then Jerry walks in, and she's like, I don't care, I love him. You guys can sit in here bitching about all your exes all you want. I love this guy. I love this guy. I don't want to be alone for the rest of my life. I want somebody in my life. 
they in that group had identified their exes and men as all enemies, she's like, I'm not joining your camp. You know how hard it is to leave a camp like that? These are groups of people that go through this. How about some of the people that are 65 years old that joined a feminist movement at 15 years old, never got married, have no kids. How many of these videos are going viral right now on social media? I wish I would have never joined a movement. I'm 65, I have a cat, no husband, no kids. What the hell am I working for? My parents are dead and it's just me. What's that all about? So many people choose the wrong enemy and it costs them years, if not decades of their lives. You have a person in your life that's challenging you, pushing you to get better, encouraging you, having high expectation of you. You think that's the enemy. That's not the enemy. The actual enemy in your life is the people around you that are saying, eat more pizza, here's more cheesecake, sleep in, don't get to work, screw your husband, the hell with your wife, I hate, you, hate your boss, he's a moron, all he cares about is money. Those are your enemies. You gotta step away from those types of people who ruin your life. And then 17 years later, you used to work with a company that if you would've stuck around, you would've had a nice sex of $2.8 million, but you screwed up, because you believe the other people that quit, and you never had that experience. And now you're sitting there for the rest of your life trying to explain to your kids why quitting was the right decision. But deep down inside, when you go to sleep and you're in front of the mirror, you know what you tell yourself? Made the biggest mistake. I should never have done that. So this is a very much of a emotional decision for a person to sit there. There's a formula on how to find that. I've been doing business planning with guys for the last, you know, business planning. You know how it is. If you have a sales team, hey, let's sit down and do your business planning for 2022. Let's do the business plan for 2006. How many years have you been doing the business? Imagine mm -hmm. how many one-on-one -on -one business plans you've done the month of December with people, right? I would sit there and business plan. Here's a one-page business plan, right? And what are your goals for the first quarter? And how many calls are you going to make? And if you do this, what are you going to get yourself? I'm going to buy myself a new suit from such and such. And Stefano Ricci, and I'm going to buy myself a C-Class or an M5 or a Range Rover. We're going to buy this house on a cul-de-sac and all this other. And here's what we're going to do. Great. You have a little bit of dream. The rest is logic. You write this thing. Maybe you look at it for a month. Done. You forgot where you even typed it out. And you don't remember what's in it after March or April. Okay. Where to me, eventually got to a point where I judged the effectiveness of business plans based on how we would do business plans together. And I see how you respond to it, where your energy goes, how you come out the gates in every year. Then I said, we're finally getting closer at learning how to do better business plans with people because you were able to pursue it. And it came down to 12 building blocks. Six of the building blocks were logical. Okay, we're talking systems, processes, things like that, capital, and then six of the blocks were emotional. You have to study your competition, but your competition is not gonna drive you the way you identify your enemy. Mm -hmm. People who have the right enemy in their lives, um, they'll be willing to tolerate way more pain than those that don't have the right enemy in their lives. Can you describe why? Because the point is if you don't do it for the rest of your life, the other person's gonna be able to say they were right. And can you live with that? If yes, go for it, fine. If not, you ain't doing it for the money. You ain't doing it because you need another Lambo or something, you're not a car guy. We're talking earlier, this house you live in that's a palace, a place most people around the world would dream about living in. This is a eight Lamborghini garage that you turn into what you turn into. Cars don't drive you. Okay, it's not something that fires you up. Who cares if you pull up in a Lambo? Okay, maybe. No, this is bigger than that. This is about you being able to look at yourself in a mirror and saying, I'm proud of you. Others can say it to you. It's great to hear it from your mom and dad. It's magical. I'm sure you remember when you heard it when your family told you they're proud of you. Very emotional moment when you hear that, right? Some parents are loving, so some parents say the day you're born. Some parents don't say it until way later on. So if you got, I'm proud of you very early just because you filled out a piece of paper, it doesn't have that big of a meaning. But if a parent didn't say that to you but 18 times while you're growing up, and then you heard the real I'm proud of you at 32 years old, you're in the car, you're gonna cry by yourself. It's a very monumental moment. You're gonna, I remember that day when it happened to, I was speaking at this office on Cerritos, and I pick up my mom from the airport, I hadn't seen her for seven years since I was in the army, and she sees what I'm doing and where I'm at at 26 years old. She's like, what happened to you? And you say, yeah, I'm proud of you. I remember my dad said it to me. I'm proud of you. We're driving back from Long Beach, uh, 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 Queen Mary, and we're in the car, and he sees what happened to me. 
And I told him, you don't have to work at a 99 cent store ever again at the uh, Inglewood, right next to Great Western Forum. I don't even know how I drove home that night. I was flying. I wasn't driving. It's an incredible feeling. But as great as that feels, there's going to be a moment where it's, you're in the car by yourself. You're 43 years old, 41 years old, 39 years old. And you can sincerely say, I'm proud of you without low standards. That victory of you versus you is a powerful thing. Very powerful thing when you go through that. So, And you're going to need that right enemy to drive you to go through those tough times because they're coming. They're going to come. It's given. To hear more about Ray Dalio's warning on the upcoming recession, which we're almost certainly already in, watch the full episode here. Talk to me about the three forces that you see that are influencing this moment. We've got banks collapsing, U.S. dollars under attack, uh, looming recession. What 